um, um, do you want to do you want to introduce yourself for for a moment? Because uh, um, you know maybe some people will be watching this. Will be uh, my fans. Maybe they'll be your fans. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I'm definitely going to be the more obscure amongst the two of us, but I'm sure there's going to be some obscurity on, on both ends. So um, to put it shortly, I am an Orthodox deacon in the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahado Church. Um, I am an Austrian, not an Austrian econ economist, but someone who appreciates Austrian economics and who genuinely, although as paradoxical and tension seeming as it may be, is open to the ideas of both anarchy and monarchy. That monarchy mm -hmm. originally rooted partially in Ethiopian history and institutions that are indigenous, but also in the idea of, of Jesus as king. And then is also someone, you know, interested in all sorts of things from martial arts to film to literature, reading and writing, you name it. Tell us, Hano, can you tell us a little bit about your, <coughs> excuse me, your background? Your your English is obviously perfect, so I'm going to guess that you grew up in the States. Uh, is that true? Uh, thank you. Uh, some people would claim I have an accent sometimes. Yeah, I was born and raised in Los Angeles where my father came here and 1973 my mom moved in shortly after via dc both of them were born and raised in ethiopia in the capital city addis ababa during the time of the absolute monarchy so they were there from the early 50s to the mid 70s and, and they basically, left and they left because of the revolution they left because of the derrick right or they left right before the revolution so the revolution uh -huh. really takes off in 74 and 75. My mom's right. father, my maternal grandfather, he was a person who was in power. So he saw right. the, the ruinations of it. But my dad's side, you know, they didn't know about it. They're just, their idea was go get educated in America for four years and come back. Because in Ethiopia at the time, there's one major university. Whereas here, you know, there are centuries of long right. university and education. And, and a lot of people don't know, you know, there's a number of things about uh, Ethiopia that a lot of people don't know. Most most people think of it as more like a, a sub-Saharan, uh, you know, country, whereas, um, you know, the Ethiopian language, correct me if I'm wrong, like Amharic is a Semitic language, right? I mean, it's, so that's uh, the official language. And um, my my dad doesn't like when I say this, but on paper, there are 87 languages. In reality, if we're talking about languages with a million speakers or more, it's about five or six. But even that is a lot. Right. And and you're in you're you're of Amharic background. You're of uh Yeah, I, mean, I am you... overwhelmingly of Amharic background, but I have people in my immediate family and more extended family who are also Tigrinya and Oromo speakers, which are two of the other major languages, Oromo right. being a Cushitic branch, but Tigrinya being another Semitic language. Right. And most most people don't. I mean, uh, among the other things most people don't know about, you know, Ethiopia, I mean, I assume most people at least know it's a Christian country, but um, they don't understand kind of the long history of the Ethiopian governing ruling class. And they don't understand mm -hmm. kind of the long, the sort of long tradition of, of nobility that, you know, the Ethiopian sort of world had and this kind of world in which the, uh, you know, sort of, you know, feudal, uh, feudal Ethiopia really lasted into the modern modern world in many ways. Now, you know, there's a book, since we're going to talk about Ethiopia, there's there's a book that, uh, you know, um, um, I need to mention, which is, of course, Richard Kapuscinski's um, uh, The Emperor, um, which... I ordered uh, it based off of hearing you speak, because my dad what, actually had a copy of it, but he said he had <laughs> lost it. He read it years ago. I, I believe it. I, I believe the... Um, um, I believe it to be largely a work of inspired fiction. Uh, you know, I don't mm -hmm. think that actually the stories in it are literally true, but they're figuratively true, essentially, I would say, which makes it, I mean, it's it's a it's it's an excellent literary work and, and there's no doubt that he improved his material. Um, and you know, perhaps it does in a way tell the story of sort of the strange world of the last days of, of Haile Selassie. Now, did your family, like your family is sort of part of the Ethiopian elite. So you must have, you had relatives who served in Haile Selassie's administration. You, uh... Yeah. So from my mom's side, we have elite in the sense of the ruling class. And my yes. dad's side though, it's more of elite in the sense of the clerical class. So my dad's side, right, right, a ton right. of priests, and then my mom's side, a, a ton of like princes and, and queens and all that good stuff. My mom's father had these 
aristocratic privileges and had he accepted them and been wedded off by Haile Selassie, the last emperor's uh, daughter, who was trying to wed him off at one point, but instead he chose, you know, my my grandmother, who was of more humble <laughs> means, more of a farmer, I wouldn't have existed and he would have been slaughtered along with 60 other dukes during the communist revolution of the 70s. Instead, right. he gives that power up. And he works in, in various diplomatic roles in Yemen, Saudi Arabia, Italy, and Egypt, eventually becoming an ambassador. And mm -hmm. then eventually, after the fall of the, of the monarchy, when the communists take over, he was one of only two ambassadors out of 33 who returned to Ethiopia and said, Ooh. I'm ready to continue working. And, <laughs> and what did he, they say to that? <laughs> they said yes. And they made him governor <laughs> of, his, of his ancestral region, Gwandar. Which, as an yeah. aside, if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, I believe that Tolkien probably named Gondor mm. based off of Gondor. Mm -hmm. And he began distributing arms to his people for about six months. <laughs> and then he and how did that work, how, how did that work out? Um, it worked out I amazing. Mean, I mean, there's been tensions ever since, but they didn't touch him. There was one assassination mm -hmm. attempt on his life, and uh, he came up with a memoir called Awured Yabazabat Hiwat. This is him. And that means a life filled with ups and downs about his assassination. <laughs> the number two person of the communist regime just got out of jail a couple years ago. His name really? is Fusaha Desta. And he wrote a book. And in his memoir, he mentions my, my grandfather and how he saved my grandfather's life when a lower ranking member of the communist party tried to assassinate him in route so from Addis Ababa to another region. This is the this number two guy. This is the guy. This is Mengistu's number two guy, right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, Correct. yeah, yeah, and and he wrote a book, and is it a sincere book? Is it a? I mean, it's this is. We could have transmitted... a whole meta. Yeah, we could have a whole meta discussion on history. I haven't read the book, but a lot of people, including my uncle, reached out to me, and I read the page that was relevant to my father, or my mm -hmm. grandfather, rather. So I need to actually go ahead and 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 read that book to give a more assessment. But I read Jeff Regenbach's "Why uh, What They Say About American History Is Wrong." I don't know if you ever mm -hmm. came across it, and Maybe, in yeah. there, you know, he talks about you know fiction versus historical fiction versus history and how you know a lot of it is narrative i'm also a part of a of a biblical podcast network called the ephesus school network where we talk about the bible as literature and you know with, beginning with ezekiel you use parables and parables within parables to teach so i'm you know i'm with you in the sense of i take everything with a kilo of salt but i think it's yeah. useful <laughs> Yes. Well, I mean, you know, you can't really the the um, the history of a place like like I mean, it's funny when you look at Ethiopia today, it's almost it's becoming um, it's it's very capitalist. It's very Chinese uh, mm -hmm. influenced. Um, um, I have a sense that there's, um, you know, like there's serious development going on in Addis Ababa. There's um, and, yeah. and I have New a deal sense that type stuff. Yeah, I have a I have a sense that there's a certain amount of administrative competence there as well as a lot of imported foreign, you know, expertise, but of course, you know, um um Ethiopia has always had that because it has this sort of strong native elite um which I think some is some of that, you know, uh, obviously the DNA is left, the sort of the pool of culture is still left even after the experience of communism and all of that. It's still kind of recognizably culturally Ethiopian, which you can't really say <laughs> of a lot of countries in the world. Um, yeah. um, but I mean, you know, the, the, um, you know, the history, like, you know, the, the, <clears throat> I don't know if you, you must know the, the history of the, um, the insane um, British expedition against King Theodore. Yes. Um, and, you know, King Theodore was, was, was not, was a little unstable himself. Um, he, and... He's the most, my, my grandfather loved him so much. He named his first son, my uncle after him. And in my opinion, uh, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of, of him and some of the things he did in terms of centralization, but that's one of the most beloved figures. And the, sure. really the modern Ethiopian nation state is Menelik II and, and Emperor Teodros. Mm -hmm. that, that's how, how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you, how, how is modern Ethiopia, how does your world judge Haile Selassie? Uh, you know, um, do you have, do Ethiopians today have a positive impression of Haile Selassie? Or are they like, eh, good, so good, my, good. my world is, is very weird because I'm always trying to get as many eclectic and dissenting voices from each other as possible. I would say the people who are most 
like me are separated into two major categories, but then there are people who are a little less like me, that would be other categories. The, the main categories of people who have the most similar culture to me would be apologists for Emperor mm -hmm. Haile Selassie. And that that's, you know, uh, mostly, you know, the clergy and people related to that ruling elite that you said, right. who are also right. some of the earliest immigrants. You know, there've been waves of immigration since the 70s and the ones, the immigrants of the 70s and 80s are not the same as the immigrants of the 2000s. The, the right. ones who came in the 70s were the ones that were better off, you know, and right. that, that changes over time. The, there's another group though, that, you know, is very against religion and against the church. So just wants to kind of, you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater. And, you know, they say, stop looking backwards, stop apologizing right. for the monarchy. And they're, they're, they're hypercritical. It's yeah, totally, yeah. totally. And, and yeah. sycophants of the American regime. And oh, European, sure. Well, you know, you know we have, we have, we have those everywhere. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> uh, um, 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 there was a phrase that used to be used. This is a phrase from the American, um, um, uh, experience in China. Actually, you may know of the, like the huge mainline Protestant, you know, missions in China that wound mm -hmm. up basically evangelizing American politics after realizing that evangelizing Christianity didn't always work that well. And, and, you know, cause things like the Box Rebellion. But, uh, you know, before then, really a 19th century phrase, they came up with the term Rice Christian. Um, oh, and, wow. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so, you know, when you go around, uh, when you go around the world, you see a lot of Rice Christians. Uh, you know, um, the one, one of the ways that I try to explain this from, from a, you know, the perspective of someone whose family was in the American uh, mm -hmm. diplomatic service is that um, one thing a lot of people don't know is that on every Thanksgiving in every American embassy in the world, there's a Thanksgiving party. And the people who are invited to this party in every, you know, city in the world that has an American mission are, of course, you know, the, the Americans who work in the mission are the significant Americans in, in that town. And then basically everyone who matters. And mm -hmm. so basically it's like, you know, you're, let's say you're in Portugal, you know, you show up at the embassy in the Thanksgiving party, you see someone, you know, you're like, oh, hi, Joao. You know, I didn't know you were cool. And yeah. Joao was like, oh, Pedro, I guess you're cool too. Right. You know, and so that, that basically brings people, there's just a sort of natural, um, you know, the path, uh, you know, the Romans had this word, which was the cursus honorum, uh, the path of honors. Mm -hmm. um, and basically everybody's cursus honorum, whether, you know, if you're a talented kid in Ethiopia, Portugal, wherever, kind of runs through these American institutions and these American values. And so, you know, really being you know, if you're an Ethiopian who wants to get ahead in the world, you know, you're going to be really powerfully drawn to ideas that will make you fit in at Harvard when you get to Harvard. Yeah. Um, and, and that, you know, that this sort of represents, um, I mean, not just a sort of betrayal of your own tradition, but more generally kind of this banalization of the world, because it's really not clear to me that the world needs more people who think like this. Um, <laughs> it seems to, have, seems to have quite a number of them already. Absolutely. Um, you um, didn't use the word, but you were on Thaddeus Russell's uh, recently, who I appreciate. Yes. And I was at one of his live Renegade University events a few years ago in, in Los Angeles. And he often, you know, would refer to it as imperialism. I don't know if you would, maybe in a softer yeah. form. And he talks about, and I know he's writing a new book on World War II, and he's gathering a lot of resources, and he's laying, you know, a lot of the blame for a lot of what has gone on at the feet of the select few in academe who are exporting yeah. that culture, as you described it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and that that exportation turns into it, it turns into the situation where forces that are part of that culture have all of the strength on their side. You know, you'll see. Um, you know, the New York Times will sometimes use the word, you know, civil society, which basically mm -hmm. means the cool people that we give money to. <laughs> um, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, you God. basically get this, um, you get this kind of astroturf, you know, effect all over the world. Um, and, and it's really, you're just like, I'm like, it's like this, you know, sort of imperialism. I mean, Imperialism is is an interesting term in a way mm -hmm. because um, you know it sort of evokes this um, predatory way of behaving internationally, where you're basically 
like the classic American example of this, of like American imperialism in sort of the classic sense really reaches its peak in the Spanish-American War, where the U.S. basically goes um, to Spain, which is this declining power, and says, hey, Spain, I see you're ruling over these people, um, you know, who need their freedom. They're clamoring very loudly for their freedom. The Americans, you know, have heard them clamoring for their freedom. Um, you need to do something. And Spain is like, man, you just trying to steal our shit, you know? <laughs> and um, the U.S. is like, no, no, we're here for, like, liberty and, you know, yeah. all that. And then, um, you all know, they, um, you know, this the strong the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must uh you know so their shift gets taken and then um you know the natives of these places were really more in the philippines are like no actually we wanted our you know we wanted to be like an independent philippines and mm -hmm. uh you know the u.s is like well actually too bad and so you know you have this situation and the british were masters of this too where they would basically come into a place with sort of some humanitarian pretext you know the british are like oh we're here to suppress the slave trade but you know while we're here you know um wow zanzibar some pretty nice real estate why don't we pick that up you know mm -hmm. <laughs> um and so they they sort of um you know it's this it's this predatory thing but um, the nature of the predation is such that when the U.S. conquers the Philippines or Cuba or Britain conquers this or that, they actually take ownership of it. And so yeah. they're like, OK, we, we've got this cool place. Let's see what we can do with it. Let's bring it into the modern world, yada, 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 yada. And so, you know, and let's actually commercially exploit it. And so you have, you know in like 1898 you have this sort of perfect marriage of like you know a yankee moralizing with with yankee enterprise and um um and you know okay it's a little rough it's a little like you know is it you know is this a beautiful thing no it's not mm -hmm. really a beautiful thing but it's like a wolf killing a deer you know it's like it feels natural it basically feels right there's like a purpose in it um and that sort of that's a moment in time in history that doesn't really last per se. And when you get into the later 20th century, it sort of starts to feel a little less like a wolf killing a deer and a little more like a dog killing sheep where, you know, it's basically like the dog has these predatory instincts. It feels fun to like run around and like rip the throats out of things. But, you know, you're going to go like, would you eat that? It's covered no. with hair. No, no, you're going home for your dog food, right? You know, uh, but man, is it fun to kill sheep? The dog doesn't even really know why it's fun to kill sheep, but it's like, wow, I'm, I'm a wolf, you know, right? You know, and uh, so you have this um, in the later 20th century when these, um, sort of revolutions are aided and abetted. And I don't really know um, what the role of the U.S. Embassy was in the Ethiopian uh, you know, revolution, but I can't really imagine that they were standing firmly on the side of Haile Selassie. Mm -hmm. um, and that would not really be their way, right? They would be like, oh, let's have a liberal revolution. Oh, whoops, we had a communist revolution. Oh, too bad. You know, um, and, and it's just like you, there's this... Um, there's this callousness to it that that really is what makes you think of the dog killing sheep um, and where you're just like, oh, well, I see we just screwed up, you know, oh, we were trying to save like Syria and Libya and all of that, but we just screwed them up. Oh, well, you know, shit happens. And, you know, it's like the dog doesn't really care. And at least the wolf cares because he's there to eat. But the mm -hmm. dog is not there to eat. The dog is just there to kind of have fun. Um, he's, and, he's aware. It's purposeful. It's not like a forgotten epigenetics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so, you know, the um um that is a very like, you know, to sort of be growing up, you know, sort of as part of the system and then realize that, oh yeah, actually this is what like, you know, one of my one of my big realizations when I was um, you know, 15 um my father was a consul in uh, in a porto in portugal and mm -hmm. um he used to have me proofread his cables his unclassified cables and i start reading these cables and i'm like you know this is not a peer-to-peer -peer relationship this is not <laughs> the u.s and portugal are not in any sense peers okay yeah they have these like treaties that are like okay if portugal is attacked the u.s will defend it and if mm -hmm. the u.s is attacked portugal will defend it you know but come on yeah. like this is not an equal relationship and it, in fact it appears to me to be that what the U.S. Embassy is here to do is, in fact, to supervise the government of Portugal. Their um, vassal state. 
in the they're, region. They're, yeah, they're, they're satellite state. You know, it's it's and 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 this this relationship doesn't. It's not sort of formally acknowledged. Everyone thinks of it as a peer to peer relationship. It was exactly the same between the USSR and Czechoslovakia, right? So you know, um, um, and I do sense. You know, the thing is, when you look at a place like Ethiopia now, it's like, you know, these are these are abuses of the past. It's really it would be very hard to imagine the embassy in Ethiopia now being able to create some kind of communist revolution. I mean, it would be farcical. It would be like, you know, nobody wants that. Nobody mm -hmm. like, you know, um, um, I mean, it, you know, of course, you know, the thing we haven't mentioned is the war with Eritrea, which um, yeah. it appears and to Somalia. actually been, and I uh, and Somalia and and the Eritrean conflict appears to actually have been settled. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Is that over for good? Or it's, you know, it's hard to say over for good. You know, many people have referenced to President Isaias Afwerki as you know the Black Kim Jong Il or Black Kim Jong Un. <laughs> yeah, there's and, a little bit of that. Yeah, uh, and so the Eritrean diaspora has been very vocal, although they're split about wanting to topple Eritrea and not being so happy with the buddy buddiness. But in terms of the open conflict, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed got his doctorate in conflict resolution, wrote his you know dissertation on that subject, right. and um, sorry, excuse me one second, and and so he basically gave up this disputed region called Badmi, which was on the border, he said, just take it. And so that's and, how he fostered <laughs> peace. And what's know? in Badmi? Is there oil in Badmi? Is there gas, gold? There's uh... there's absolutely nothing in Badmi. There's no formal fence. There's no formal border. There are people who are like cousins and aunts and back and forth. You know, they disrespect the border back and forth. It's just sometimes that there would be some troops there and, and they would, you know, gun people down if they found them. And, and there right. would be constant skirmishes but really there's there's nothing fertile there there's nothing big it's a few small villages right and and it and it really just came out of this um you know the conflict came out of you know real really i mean it was both afworkies you know government which was a little um little kim jong ilish uh you know and these very, sort of very intense feelings of of nationalism and mm -hmm. i'm guessing that these days you know like you don't see like hostility between the Ethiopian and Eritrean diaspora in the U.S. very much, I would imagine. Um, less, less so. You know, it's it's <laughs> it's more associated with the diaspora who are in woke culture and who mm. are worried about cultural appropriation. For example, when Nipsey Hussle, I don't know if you know the rapper Nipsey Hussle. Yeah, I, I don't know. We weren't we weren't friends, but uh, <laughs> heard, uh, yeah, he, he's a really cool guy. Um, l last year. Um, you know, I, I got to serve at his funerary service, which is one of the cool things. But um, at his, oh, was he was he partly his, Ethiopian? His father he, is Eritrean. Was he, was he but of course, you know, I'm older than Eritrea. You know, ah. uh, Eritrea is 1993, so his father was <laughs> squarely born right. in Eritrea when it was a state, one of the 14 states of Imperial Ethiopia, and so uh, his father is. Eritrean or Ethiopian that's part of the you know the debates in in those cultures in the first place and people were right. spitting vitriol back and forth with each other because some people would use Photoshop for example and put like half an Ethiopian flag on one side and an Eritrean flag on one side and the Eritreans would be like why are you <laughs> culturally appropriating you know our rapper you know why can't you just let us have a thing right, right, and, right, and right. you know they'd go back and forth <laughs> Um, and I, I try right, to explain it's, them. it's it's nonsense for some of the reasons that you said. I'll give you one small example with an ethnic group. There's an ethnic group known as the Afar, who are a mostly nomadic group, and and they practice a synchronistic version of Islam. They live on the border of Djibouti, Eritrea, and Ethiopia. Um, there's no such thing as a Djiboutin. Um, they're either Somali ethnicity or they're Afar. So there are Afar in Djibouti, Afar in Ethiopia and Eritrea. The most Afar are in Ethiopia. And they're in this corner where they all meet and they cross that border like it's nobody's business. And they're all closer to each other in every way, like cuisine wise, religion wise, language wise, than an e Ethiopian would be with them or an Eritrean would be with them or right. another, a Somali Djiboutin. So my Amharic people are closer related to the Tigrinya speaking Orthodox Christians of Eritrea than the than those Eritreans would be with the Afar. And and there are many different you know examples of this that that show that 
you know, the most salient identity is not the national border there. Oh, sure, sure, sure. And are Tigrinya and Amharic mutually intelligible? Can you understand Tigrinya or is it like Spanish and Portuguese? How how distant is that? It's like Spanish and Portuguese. Um, yeah. I, you know, I don't know the Romance languages enough to say exactly what it's. I don't know if it's Romanian and Italian or French, but it's it's something like that. And there are a lot of, you know, debates, even um, the history is not clear exactly as they emerge. But the most modern scholarship that I have seen says that Gez, which is the liturgical language of of both um, and Tigrinya are more like sisters and Amharic is like the distant cousin. So that they had, you know, they each had some proto ancestor that had a shared proto ancestor. And, and that goes back so deep into prehistory that, you know, it's really difficult to determine. But I understand, especially like I say, I've, I've sat in on Eritrean church settings where they're quoting from the scriptures in Gez while speaking Tigrinya. And so the, when the subject matter is the same, I could understand because I try hard, maybe 60 to 70 percent of what is being said. But, you know, if they were going to talk about the Kardashians or soccer or something and, and not use any guz, then I would be lost. And it, like like in certain songs I listen to where, I, you know, I'm pretty lost, especially when you know, add a beat and things like that. Makes sense. But of course, there's plenty of, you know, uh, uh, Tigray provinces in Ethiopia. I mean, there's plenty of Tigrayans yes. in, in Ethiopia. Right, Correct. Right, and right. the region where my grandfather is from, uh, Gwandar, is an Amharic region where something like 50 to 80 percent of the people also speak Tigrinya as a second language. So right, 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 that's what right. I was kind of intimating, you know, earlier, earlier too. And those provinces, Eritrea and Gwandar and Tigray, historically during the monarchy, often would have like one one aristocrat that would be ruling all, all of them because of the similarity right. of, their, of their culture. Because of the similarity of their, of their language and because it, it was sort of a natural, it was kind of a natural duchy almost in a sense. It was like a satellite of the Ethiopian empire. Exactly. Got it, got it, got yeah. it, got it, it. it was the access to the Red Sea. Right. Obviously, still is. Yeah, um, yeah. and and um, yeah, 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 and and you know, but the thing is, like, if you look at a place like Ethiopia today, it's like, you know, I feel like you know the level of interest in politics has probably been going down continuously for about forty years. Is that um, like I imagine, you know, when you look at a developing, you know country city like like Addis Ababa you know um what you see is a lot of people whose parents and grandparents were very involved in these just very intense heinous political struggles mm -hmm. and now they're just like let's live our lives let's develop our country let's make some money let's chill out about this crazy crazy stuff because they all when they think of these times they must all think of it as basically this was the crazy time. I mean, you know that book, I think there's some controversy about it by Nega Mazlekia, um, when the, what's it called? The, it was, it was a memoir published about I'm 20 years ago, something about the, hang on, let me, um, mm. it was, a, it won some prizes and then the guy's ghostwriter um, complained that she had actually written most of the book, but it's still a pretty <laughs> good book. Um, it's basically, um, Nigam is like he, uh, um, his notes from the hyena's belly is the, uh, is the title. I've heard that title, but I'm, I have not read that. Um, you know, it, it's his basically um, his story of living through like, you know, revolutionary Ethiopia. You know, he fights in a guerrilla army. Mm -hmm. um, he, um, um, you know, and those those I mean, those wars were just extremely intense and, and, and brutal, basically. Uh, is my understanding, <laughs> and um, yeah. and of course the Derg was extremely intense and brutal, um, and um, you know, I when people, I feel like that in a country lives the sort of very long shadow, much the way the kind of cultural revolution has left a shadow in China of basically people being like, let's take this politics thing and let's just push it aside. It doesn't apply to us. We don't want to play this game. And of course, there's always some people playing the game, but it's more about mm -hmm. like more about sort of power in this kind of crass kleptocratic sense. I'm not sure there's still plenty of corruption among the ruling party in Ethiopia. Right. You know, but um, um you know, it's not Vermont, you know, but at the same time, it's like, I mean, you know, cu cu countries that are in that state of 
kind of cultural progress, I think are very similar to the U S in like the 1890s, you know, what people mm -hmm. call the Gilded age, where again, you had this past memory of this sort of tremendous political military cataclysm, uh, which was the civil war. And then people were like, Oh yeah, let's just build shit and make money. <laughs> um, maybe we could just build shit and make money instead of doing this crazy. Right. And, and, uh, and and the crazy the crazy gets forgotten. I don't know if that's a that's a sort of permanent you know state of affairs, but you know certainly the impression I have of Eritrea was that it was very much for all of the '90s and early 2000s. It was this like garrison state where people like lived underground and like really strange stuff going on there. Is that accurate? Is that yeah? Part of the issue is that there you know there's so much darkness that it's hard to say. You know one of the commendable things you know and, and this goes to i think some of the points you've made elsewhere about being detached in your analysis i you know in my profession i've i've been a neutral many times before so i try to mm -hmm. analyze these things the same way without the emotions and it, it, you know one of the things that are commendable is that you know he would uh rebuke president uh isayas would rebuke for example the world you know health organization the imf and all these all these globalist institutions that are trying to lend a right. helping neoliberal hand right. and and you know that that kind of strikes some pride in you but at the same time you know he's got military conscription just like israel and and the united states back in the day um this, you know compulsory military conscription yeah. um which and, you, many and, you people and, you, and you develop this you know when you have this it's 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 really i you know when you look at these isolated states or these states that are like, no, we're going to be our own country. We're going to mm -hmm. do things our own way. You, you, you basically in the modern world, you feel that that conflict because on the one hand, you're basically like, yeah, Eritrea should be Eritrea. It shouldn't be New Jersey, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and um, the, um, the goal of the life is not to turn everything into New Jersey. Um, I think that that's a really bad thing. On the other hand, basically, the problem is that when you try to do that, the forces available for sort of creating that isolation and creating that always turn out to be these pretty dark forces, right? Yeah. And so you're basically, um, um, you sort of, you know, you can even basically be like, yeah, actually, you know, North Korea is more Korean than South Korea, and maybe there's something good about that. <laughs> but, you know, the things that you have to do, um, you know, to do that in the modern world tend to be really, really grim. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. even even like the Soviet Union and China, one of the um, like, you know, China manages this trick of basically taking this monarchy that Mao has created and kind of turning on capitalism and saying, okay, let's take a chance. We can afford to have these businesses here. We can control having an economy at the same time as keeping our political system. And, you know, Lenin tries this in the 1920s and it's a success there too. Um, but he basically senses that because he's doing this, he's losing political control. Um, and so, you know, the ability to basically say, we're going to be um, a not sort of crazy, weird, paranoid society, but we're also going to be ourselves is that's a very, very difficult thing to do. Um, and, um, you know, I don't I don't sort of really know what the solution for that is. I think, you know, um, Bhutan has done an excellent job of just saying, yeah, let's just like not have people bus plane loads of tourists, you know, appearing every day. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that there's a lot, um, you know, economic self-sufficiency can go a long way. It's crazy that anyone in Africa is wearing clothes made in China or Bangladesh or whatever. That's insane. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, there's still, when you look at a lot of these, um, you know, let's say, you know, I think the Ethiopian economy has been growing, but like Chinese rates, like 10% a year, you know, in a lot of situations, of course, you've got high population growth as well. Um, but, you know, still like that's really, that's booming economics, but, you know, it's also booming economics driven by foreign direct investment using foreign technology, using probably a lot of foreign construction firms to build. Mm -hmm. Does Addis have a subway now? Does it like, or it's like it has the like Chinese over the ground trail Metro type deal. Right. You know, probably built by the Chinese, I would expect, you know, and, yeah. um, 
I, I would imagine. And when the when Chinese construction companies do work in Ethiopia, do they import Chinese labor or do they use Ethiopian labor? Or uh, it's a like mixture of both. But yeah, they they're sending a lot of men. You know, that's an yeah, interesting yeah. part of it too. There are some women, but it's like an overwhelming amount of Chinese men that are being sent and and. The fascinating thing is like they're assimilating and integrating, like they're learning Amharic and, you know, some of them are, <laughs> are the voicemails of some people, like the automated messages and some people like wow. freaking out. They're like, and are Ethiopians learning Chinese to, to deal with them or? Uh... I, I have not seen that as much, um, you know, I, but, you know, I have like a distant cousin who's, who's mixed. So, you know, and I know some other people who are mixed and they might you know, study it on their own because of that. But I, I've never seen like a serious group of people who are studying Chinese. Somebody must be maybe at Addis somebody, Ababa somebody be. I yeah. mean, you know, that, because that relationship is almost like financially, uh, my feeling is that Ethiopia is in some ways closer to China now than it is to the West. Um, and I feel like also the sort of the government pattern of Ethiopia is more Chinese in some ways. It's like, is yeah, it a one party? Marxist. Yeah, they're still nominally Marxist. Right. And mm -hmm. it's, it's more, it's more or less a one party state. It's like, mm -hmm. has, yeah, 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 yeah. It you is. know, and it's, it's uh, as if the Republicans or the Democrats, you know, had 99.9% .9 of the seats, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, not I mean, respect it because it's less Cal of a force. California, California works that way too, you know. Yeah, the, the, seems to still function to a certain extent. Still got uh, a third though. Cali's still about a third, you know, a third yeah, different yeah. party. Yeah, that's yeah, probably yeah. going away, but not, 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 not really, not really enough to matter. Um, um, but, uh, but, but, yeah. I mean, I think that I used to sort of like the 20th century will be. It's very sort of, you know. There's this term. Um, that the historian uh, Carl Jaspers, uh, you know, came up with to describe the sort of the great period of Greece and Rome, which he called it the axial age. Um, and, you know, the 20th century is a very like, you know, I think it will be a more important century than the 21st, you know, um, in that it sort of determined the fates of so many places. Um, it's hard to see, like, you know, could politics or violent politics make a return to Africa, possibly. I mean, Ethiopia is, of course, so different from the rest of Africa. Um, but I mean, it's different. It's, there's only one Ethiopia. It's a very unique place, right? You know, but yeah. uh, the um, um, could that return? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I don't feel like really many people in Ethiopia want it to return. There are traces. I think like you said, the overwhelming majority are for stability and for the rule of law and, and more yeah. about trimming changes. But especially there are a, a sizable minority group who wants to secede based off the Oromo identity. And the issue right. is, you know, there are arguments about where exactly they originate, but the Oromo ethnic group sometime in the 1500s originates somewhere around, you know, the Kenyan border. Some people say they came from Madagascar. It's not really clear. Um, but Madagascar. what is clear, no. yeah, no, no, no. they're bizarre, bizarre theories people have. It's really, it's just really crazy. And it doesn't yeah. help that, you know, they had mostly oral language and just recently, right. you know, began writing, but they expanded northward all the way to the border of Eritrea without getting into Eritrea and then southward down to about the midpoint in Kenya. And so this now, is do huge they, do they have Somali, do they have Somali roots, Thoromo? Do they like and I, that's an I don't think language? so. They're both yeah. Cushitic. Oromo and right. Somali are both Cushitic. And so yeah. they should have more immediate stuff. I, I was interested a lot in this ancestry thing a few years ago. So I took one of those, you know, 23 and me tests. Uh -huh. And I exchanged data with someone who's allegedly like a hundred percent Oromo. And I'm as close as you can get to hundred percent Amharic. Everyone's gonna be mixed. Yeah. And then I exchanged with someone who was ethnically Somali. And what should happen on paper, according to the theories that, that these anthropologists had, is that the, the Oromo and the Cushitic person should have way more in common than me and them. But the Oromo and I ended up having way more in common. And so <laughs> I, I don't know exactly yeah, you know, yeah. what that all means, um, but I, I think there's, there's some, some fantasy in, and some, some bias, some attachment, some passionate attachment rather than detachment in the way in which people wrote some of these narratives that, that oh, describe yes. the differences. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, the, the, um, there's so much 
there's there's still especially when you're talking about traditional people who haven't been you know, sort of fully brought into the future i think you know one of the problems is that you're sort of looking for um um for for people like us you know who sort of who grew up in this world a sort of complete modernity and we're like you know this is this is actually kind of a hellscape um you know and 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 that for you know i'm i'm probably a little older than you i was born in the 70s uh you know and little. so um um believing in the sort of vision of you know the world is like global america was very that was how i was sort of brought up to believe and so um you know to basically realize hey wow turning the world into america maybe not really the right thing you know it's like <laughs> it's a sort of very modernist dream it's like you know the james c scott who's a writer you probably know uh you know mm -hmm. talks about sort of what it takes to turn um a forest into a managed forest and you know like in germany they have these very managed forests the trees are all in straight lines right you wow. know it's a forest but um, very efficient <laughs> very efficient and then they're like hey why are we having ecological problems right you know and and uh, and it's like the idea of turning the world into this sort of american forest with like you know american strip malls everywhere or whatever um you know was really um you know uh, the thing is when you're a kid and you're in countries that are a little bit third worldy um you know it's especially easy to believe in that because you're basically you go to a place where like the roads are bad and you know things are very dirty and etc cetera, etc cetera. and then you come home to america and here there are these nice clean four lane highways you know and everything basically works um you know there are little patches of stuff that doesn't you know doesn't work but you don't really see that as a kid uh and you're just like wow everyone everything should you know after spending like three hours in a traffic jam you know trying to get from one side of a porto to the other side of a porto you're like yes you know we should have a beltway here we should have you know like <laughs> everything should be american and i should be able to stop and get my you know uh, kfc you know at the next strip <laughs> mall down down the road between a porto and lisbon right you know and and that's a very like that's a compelling way to think and then as you get a little older you're like oh you know that means that we're trying to turn the world into this sort of managed forest mm -hmm. um and so you start to get these ideas that are basically sort of okay something needs to come after modernity and one of the problems with this you know um this i forget the the name uh, Guillaume Fay i that's it i came up with this term archaeofuturism which i don't mind at all um and um the problem in a sense is that when you're trying to sort of recreate um a world with a little more variety and a little more interest, or you're trying to just reimagine that, we're a very long way from recreating it. You sort mm -hmm. of think that these pre-modern forces would kind of be something that could be pushed into helping that come about. And I just don't think that they are. I think that in a way, everyone needs to pass through the fires of modernity to kind of come out the other end and be like no actually this thing we've been doing for 2000 years really actually works better but the thing is until you've had that experience of basically becoming fully modern it's sort of really it's very hard to fight modernity without being fully immunized against it uh, mm -hmm. I guess I would say in some ways. Um, and so when you see people who have this unbroken inheritance of tradition, you're almost like these people are are poorly, you know, um, um, they're sort of not ready for for what they're fighting. I'm curious as as a you know, a Christian in in a different sect, I'm wondering if you if you saw the uh, uh, the HBO series The Young Pope. Do you know the young Pope? I didn't. I didn't. It was on my radar, but I didn't see it. Tell me you about should, it. You should, it's, it's worth going back and seeing, um, you know, because uh, I, when I first heard about the young Pope, I was like, well, this is going to be very, very impious, right? Because you're basically like in, in a sense, I'm not a Catholic, but in a sense, yeah. it's like it's just objectionable to me. Like you're, you're going to mm -hmm. like be like set, you know, HBO is like satirizing the Catholic church with like Jude Law as a Pope. Right. And then, you know, you realize this is not actually a 
a production of HBO at all. This is a production of this Italian director, Paolo Sorrentino, uh, who's an amazing director. And for whatever reason, Paolo Sorrentino thought it would be, uh, you know, right. Um, you know, God only knows what he was thinking. He thought he could get away with making a movie about a right wing pope. And so, you know, Jude Law is actually an extremely right wing pope um, and, you know, not too many spoilers here, but, you know, the main this is like a 10 episode, you know, miniseries. Uh, the main purpose of Jude Law in this miniseries is to um, eradicate homosexuality from the Catholic Church. And wow. you're just like, what? How is this on HBO? Right. You know, yeah. and, 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 and it's and. And it's, yeah, how to get past the censors. And it's not even treated like, you know, I, I suspect that many people watching this are like, okay, is he the hero? Is he the anti-hero? What's going on here? I mean, it's an art film, right? It's it's mm -hmm. actually, it's very high quality cinema. It's not an agitprop of any kind, but you just, you're watching this and you're like, um, you know, as an extreme right wing, what's neat about sort of the Jude Law character, the perspective that's uh, that's portrayed there um is that he's not a pre-modern you know reactionary he's a postmodern reactionary and so you know <laughs> this is someone who is basically completely fluent in the language of modernity and mm -hmm. being completely fluent in the language of modernity makes you just much more effective at pushing back against it you know and so it's like you uh, you know, you're clearly, I mean, fluent in the language of modernity because you grew up in fucking L.A., right? You know, but at the same <laughs> time, uh, do you speak Gez? Do you do? Uh, so I mean, speak I'm, is a I'm, tough term with a dead language. Yeah. But you're... so I will argue I'll give you pushback and I'll call it a living tongue in Semitic uh -huh. tongues. We say tongue instead of language, but it means the okay. same thing, of course. And I would say I speak Gez at an elementary school level i'm like 60 to 70 percent there every sunday and uh, that's just you know formal worship but individual sure. worship like i pray in guz i sing in guz and we do that there there's a category of the traditional school called kene which means submission and it, it's the idea of submitting well, your like mouth islam. to god like it's like islam like islam that's the same you know you know islam means submissions as, as well right? yes exactly uh, but this is yes. this, this is about uh, you know yes, through sorry, poetry and those people who study that mm -hmm. are the best at it for example we have a bishop in our diocese of southern california i'm at his cathedral and him and I, sometimes some people have recorded us before where we would talk. Whenever we talk to each other, we speak in guz. Other people, they don't like that it's a struggle for them. And so they're less willing to like experiment with it. But if you go to Ethiopia to these traditional schools, you'll find tens of thousands of people composing original poetry in guz every single day, singing guz every single day. And it's the language of prayer for tens of millions of people. So it, and, and, it's and live is this, in, is this, in a little sense. Is this, I mean, this must not have been, you know, the same under the Derg, right? I mean, this is a, this is a, a re reinvention or a re rebirth. It was the to same. Some it was the same. The difference is that there was less trust of people because you would have right. priests who are cadres and nothing's mm -hmm. going to make you lose, you know, um, to use the Catholic example, everyone should know about confession, right? And we have the same thing except without the, the toll, the toll booth. And so, you know, <laughs> you're going to lose that trust really quickly if you find priests who are cadres. You know, there'd be priests with right. like AKs, you know, who are working for the communists. So, so, so the the Derek the Derek the Derek didn't try to wipe out traditional Ethiopian religion. They tried to own it, is what you're saying. Yeah, they they infiltrated it and they spread a lot of so like they sowed a lot of seeds of discord. But they were more interested at that time, for example, in preventing new religions. So, for example, the Protestants right. who came actually were persecuted by the communists more than the Orthodox. That's interesting. That's uh, yeah. that's like, you know, so in a way, it's kind of more Stalinist than Leninist, you know, in, in that you're trying to own the traditions of the country. And that, you know, presumably kept a lot of the, you know, the amazing cliffside monasteries and so forth, you know. Exactly. Those, those things, you know, geography, you know, call it accident yeah. or providence, you know, has helped them a lot too. And that's another thing to go back about President Isaias of Eritrea. One of the, the rules he's had in place that he has not changed is no new religions. Like that's, that's one of his yeah. firmest things. You know? <laughs> At the same time, he has the, the patriarch 
of Eritrea, Abuna uh, Anthony Antonios. He's been under house arrest for several years, and he's the oldest prisoner of war on earth. He's in his 90s, and they bring him out about once wow. a year to celebrate, you know, um, the the finding of the true cross. It's, it's one of these holidays of the Orthodox Church. So they bring him out almost like a prop to bless them, and then they say, "Go back in your house arrest." Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, still a still a fairly weird situation. How old is is Afwerki? He must be pretty old at this point. Yeah, he he's, a... he's got to be in his late sixties or early seventies. Not that old. What happens to yeah. Eritrea when he dies? Does does uh, does anyone that know? That is a great question. Some of the diasporic <laughs> Eritreans are afraid that imperialist Ethiopians are going to try to take it over again. Nobody has a direct issue. He was asked by, I think, Al Jazeera or BBC in this phenomenal clip that gets shared all around. They said, when's the next election going to be? And he goes, election? What's that? You know, he said, we're going to look at the election in the United States, see how they proceed. And then maybe in a few decades, we'll have one of our own. <laughs> uh, I mean, you, 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 you know, you have to admire these. I mean, you know, you look at someone like like off worky and you know like any leader like that yeah you know is he a little crazy but you know these people are also larger than life you know mm -hmm. and you, you have you have to give that to them in a sense um you know the idea that like you know there's sort of something like someone like that i have no doubt that he perceives himself whatever you know things that he's done you know that have harmed his country i have no doubt that he perceives himself internally as just completely a servant of his country right. um and um um you know that's uh i mean that's that's a something to be uh, something to be admired i mean um now you know the uh uh do I want to live underground and be drafted into a World War One style war for an empty yeah. piece of land somewhere that means nothing? No, uh, but or, uh, no press freedom. You know, total press yeah. suppression, yeah. jailing yeah. of dissidents. You know, all, all the things that you could think of. You know, it's not without reason. You know, it wasn't callously that people call him the Black North Korea. It's not exactly the same. You know, the people aren't. Yeah. And exactly starved to death in, in the same exact way and and the spy network it's not as weird not it's not there. as weird but it's still weird you know yeah. and and it's still it's still a sort of a piece of the 20th century that survives into the 21st mm -hmm. is i guess i would say uh you know a better regime like that um whereas you know the regime in Ethiopia seems much more like a very standard piece of the early 21st century um, in that it's like it has a sort of gilded age. Oh, let's recover from the 20th century of vibe. How often do you get back to Ethiopia? Do you? So from 1994 to 2000, I believe I went every summer for two nice. to three months. Nice. From 2000 to about 2008, I went every other year. And then the last time I went was 2011. So now it's been nine years since I've been. And strangely, I've become the most Ethiopian in that sense. And, and <laughs> that's, Ethiopian not, community. that's not that's not unheard of. Uh, now, Addis Ababa is that's a highland city, right? So it has good weather. It has like it's like eternal spring. It's a yeah, it's higher yeah. than Denver. It's it's yeah. it's ridiculous. Um, where my grandfather's from, I think it goes up to like 14,000 feet. Addis Ababa is like eight thousand feet wow. above sea level. It's yeah, yeah it's that's, tough to breathe. That's, that's very, that's very, that's very. It's tough it's to breathe, runners. but uh, you know, I'll bet, I'll bet the well, I'm at like five thousand feet, at, feet at, at right now, and you, you definitely feel the difference. But when you get up to eight thousand, that's a that's a different thing. Uh, but I mean, you know, months just, of sunshine is the um, that's what you see when you come in. That's the like yeah. advertisement for people. One to throw people off because we have thirteen months because we have our own calendar, <laughs> which is and then two because it's sunshine yeah. all the time. Yes, yes. I mean, I imagine there are parts of there are parts of Ethiopia that have an almost California like feel to them, oh, yeah. right? In terms of Addis Ababa yeah. is just like it, D down to the earthquakes. No natural disasters besides earthquakes, and it's been it's been a while. It's actually one thing my mom is afraid of is that some big earthquake is going to come and the infrastructure is not there. That certain things. I mean, are... all the all the all the, like all the, like Chinese concrete made with you yeah. know, sand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that, yeah, that kind of the biggest issue with like the Chinese or or the Arabs that would come in is that the why I call this regime Marxist in the same way that the previous one was and, and why they didn't take a big difference is like during the time of the monarchy, 
um, lands were granted to people and you know their serfdoms and vassals and all this stuff um, but for the most part you get to work it and from the time of the communist and now they call themselves a federal democracy nobody owns their land for example my grandfather uh, built the house that i used to stay in and visit all the time and he owns the house but the land which the house rests on is this thing exactly like you are right to point to chinese it's the chinese property system property rights system where everyone has a 99 year lease yeah and the 99 year leases owns. yeah 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 Nobody yeah yeah it. yeah no the the the, <laughs> the weirdness of the 99 year lease system is so like you know you're like okay this is depreciating and you know um um yeah it's and and um but you know it's still like you know uh there are, i think in hong kong like you'll see like 999 year leases like they're like <laughs> there, there are strange things that you can do with these strange systems but it yeah. all it, it comes back to you know uh, this this legacy of ideology that everybody's still struggling with because you have to you basically you still when you have a sort of a, a revolution that that moderates you often you wind up sort of paying it's like the way the chinese pay sort of lip service to marxism you know now mm. and they couldn't be the they're like the least marxist <laughs> country in the world right uh, <laughs> you know? and 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 somehow you know marxism has become this synonym for rapacious capitalism because um you know chinese capitalism is of course incredibly rapacious and um you know, but it's still, it's still, it's still Marxist and it gets things done. I mean, you know, it's yeah. like you build, um, um, I don't know how much, I mean, I'm sure, you know, Ethiopia, first of all, still has like a very fast population growth, I imagine. Oh, yeah. And, and there are, I'm sure there are, you know, while the, there are business district parts of, of Addis Ababa that are shiny and gleaming, I'm sure there are others that sort of look a little more slum like. Um, yeah. and it's when you get out in the country, it's never like one place, like it's, it's everywhere, you know, the yeah. Hummer and the Corvette drive next to donkeys and oxen. There's a grass hut next to a skyscraper. And it's not like, there's no ghetto. Like when you go there, yeah, there's nowhere yeah, that's yeah. the ghetto. There are poorer areas, but it's just like extreme desolate destitute poverty next to you know neoliberal affluence like side by right. side but, but even 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 that destitute poverty i imagine has a somewhat more intact social structure than um yeah. the worst parts of la yeah yeah, yeah there yeah, yeah. um again i haven't been in nine years so this might be outdated and i know some cops would crack down on it so technically it's like illegal because you need you know occupational licensing but you'd have right. ridiculous shit that you'd never see in the united states like you have little kids who are beggars and they'll have like little boxes and in the boxes you know they'll they'll shout out all the items they have you know they'll have like uh tissues and cigarettes you know they'll sell you cigarettes you know yeah, like five yeah, years yeah, old yeah. they got cigarettes that they're selling you they're they're selling you bootleg dvds one of them tried to sell me borat five and i was like man when did two <laughs> Four come four. Out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. You'll you'll find you'll find that everywhere. You'll find that everywhere in the third world, like the little micro capitalism. I mean, you know, in in Nigeria, my father was uh, posted to Nigeria for uh, for three years. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I was while I was in college, and I never visited him in Nigeria, which I really regret because I mean, it's an insane country, right? You know, but yeah. um, you know, basically, if you drive, you know, uh, from anywhere in lagos to the lagos airport you wind up in what's called a ghost low um which is basically the same thing you're like driving along and you know and it's a little dangerous i mean nigeria mm -hmm. is a much more dangerous country than ethiopia i believe but um you know same thing every you know all these sort of little traders little kids selling you stuff you know um and um you know somehow they manage to make a living doing that or make enough to feed themselves, you know, but it's still, I mean, you have a population increasing two or 3% a year. Uh, what is 90 million, a hundred million people in Ethiopia? Yeah. I think that the right? numbers are like a hundred, 110 million. And uh, when yeah, my parents yeah, were there, yeah. it's just like a microcosm. When my parents were there from the fifties to the seventies, it's like a million people in Addis Ababa. Now there's like eight to 10 million, you know, it's yeah, huge yeah, difference. Yeah. That's the capital city versus, you know, the rest of it. But yeah, and that, now some a lot of that is, of course, people migrate, you know, to the capital city. But um, mm -hmm. you know, you still have, um, um, I mean, it's still it's it's urbanizing <laughs> at this tremendous rate, and it's really like the thing is that, um, 
you know, a country like Ethiopia really, I would actually categorize it as a developing country. I mean, it's sort of literally a developing country, you know, which is in many cases a euphemism. Yeah. Um, you know, but but not really that for 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 Ethiopia. I mean, the one what I think one of the worst tropes for countries like Ethiopia though is that uh, they tend to lose their elites they i mean obviously yeah, the brain drain brain drain you know and i re recall uh obviously very different kind of country but i recall reading a statistic that there are more Ghanaian doctors in the uk than in ghana right you know yeah. it's like yeah Brit britain can't train any doctors so we need to take all the doctors from ghana yeah mm -hmm. that's that's clearly good in some some sense so um that's can't imagine what sense would be. you're right like people are returning yeah, my uh, my friend was um, a Fulbright scholar, and she studied a topic that she called the brain retain, which is first the intellectuals that chose in the face of the brain drain to stay there. I have another friend who runs an organization called the Ethiopia Diaspora Fellowship, where she sends about six Ethiopians every year born in the United States to be in it and work in Ethiopia for about six months. And a lot of them have begun to also stay, extend their stay a year, two years. Some of them, like one of my friends, she just came back. She she was there for four years. Um, mm -hmm. I have another friend who he was born there versus these ones who are born here. And he he lived here for about 10 years, but now he's been back in Ethiopia for three years. And, and he's a PhD in, in uh, industrial and organizational psychology. So it's like serious intellectuals do it too. And yeah, a and, number and of them have called me to do it and I haven't pulled that trigger yet. <laughs> and and it's not and it's not it's not like a sacrifice. It's like you're actually like, oh, I can actually live fairly well in this country. Um and it feels like my country, you know. <laughs> and uh that's that's a you know uh I mean that's just so much better than this situation of like every Everybody talented in the country just leaves, you know, and you're just the thing is, you know, in a way when you extract when you have a country, you know, one of the things, you know, you're, you're, you're probably familiar with uh, with bell curves and all of that. And one of the things that you get in any uh, country in the world that has any history of civilization is you get a fat right tail on your bell curve because you get aristocracies and these mm -hmm. aristocracies are basically engaging in artificial selection they're like they get really really you know all aristocracies get really you know hoity-toity about breeding and who's related to who yeah. and you know they're doing this you know not because they understand modern dna you know but because they are from cultures that are bred animals for zillions of years. And they understand like, wow, you know, who you mate with is really, really, really important. Um, and so you basically get these, these sort of selective aristocracies basically breed this kind of purebred human almost in a sense. It's like a different kind of animal. Um, and, you know, you see changes in facial features. You see like, you know, in a lot of, you go to like France and it's very easy to say, Oh, this is this person is a descendant of the French nobility. This person is originally a peasant. It's like oh, wow, really? they actually I, I they look that. they I look different. They look different, you know, wow. and 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 you know because basically sexual selection plays a lot of role in that. You've mm -hmm. basically been breeding princesses for a thousand years, you know. Yeah. Um, so everyone has these like finely sculpted noses, you know, or whatever. Um, and so what happens when the West encounters? these you know countries is it basically just strip mines this aristocracy and like takes it off to go and be basically join the western aristocracy which frankly is overpopulated anyway um and um you know harvard could easily like you know like most like at least 10 percent of the people that apply to harvard could you know be do perfectly well there and so you don't really need these people their own countries really do need these people. Harvard doesn't need them. The West doesn't mm -hmm. need them. Um, and you're just uh, extracting them in this predatory way, you know? Um, and so like the, um, the sort of alternative world where, I mean, you're never going to be able to bring back, uh, I wouldn't say never, but bringing back feudal, fe you know, true like feudal Ethiopia, like, mm -hmm. you know, the Ethiopia that um, Rambeau, you know, lived in, um, you know, in Harar, as you know, the story of yeah, Rambeau. Yeah, talk about uh, Arthur Rambeau. That was, that was one of the things that you had mentioned that I yeah. bet, to correct me if I'm wrong, has anyone asked you about that? Because I asked you about that and I was like, wow. Uh, like, 
I know, no, no one has asked me about that. But I mean, you know, the story of, 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 I mean, it's an amazing story, right? You know, um, and, um, and just the feeling of, like the feeling of being in, in Africa at that time or being in, you know, he was just and like, Yemen. Uh, yeah, and in Yemen, you know, and, and, um, you know, he just wants this like totally authentic, you know, non-european experience and he gets it and then of course all these places become you know more and more europeanized um harar you know, is my paternal grandmother's city and there's a closer city which is the second largest city besides Addis Ababa called Diredawa which is very close where my my father's father is from those two areas during the time of the king were chief cosmopolitan areas there were turks Greeks, mm -hmm. Italian, French. My my paternal grandfather spoke ten languages, none of right. which were English. You know, like he spoke right. French, and then like seven Ethiopian languages, but then like Greek and Turkish and Arabic because of how diverse that area in Harar and in Diredawa were, and they were Orthodox Christians living in these predominantly Muslim areas closer to the Ogaden, which is that Somali ethnic region. Right. Of, but the, the ruling Ethiopia. class there was the ruling class was always Christian there, right? Yeah, I mean, the, it was always Amharic it, Christian. Yeah, it's a Muslim fortified city, like technically, and it's the third holiest place in the world for Islam. But yeah, it's mm. it's like it's also the place where the Northern Orthodox Christians would migrate to. So right. it's a, it's a confluence of those two two things, but it, it was historically like a Muslim sultanate within the um, various kingdoms. Um, you know, there were various like like the Oromo had a system called Gada, which is you know a, a sort of indigenous governance with their you know pre-Christian pre-Islamic religion called Waqifanna. Mm. The Afar and the uh, Harar and the Somali, they they all have their own sultanates and then all of them pay homage to the king. So the king right. kind of just, you know, is collecting money from them, but everybody's kind of, you know, running their own their own show as long as, you know, they pay oh, tribute. That's, that's, that's feudalism for you, right? I, yeah. you know, and, <laughs> and there's still there's still a lot of like feudal architecture in Hara, right? You know, and mm -hmm. there's still like you go there and it's still, you know, I mean, it, it's a it's a tourist site. But, you know, the 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 um um under the thing that was so unique about Ethiopia, of course, never being colonized per se, doesn't mean it wasn't wasn't sort of penetrated and influenced by foreign influence. It doesn't mean that mm -hmm. you know people didn't go there to sell you know rifles to you know whoever yeah. um, and, and occupied so, for five years. Some people have trouble saying that. I don't have trouble saying it. O occupied, you know, yeah, guerrilla warfare. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Down, yes, but. yes, yes, yes. You have the whole Italian period, right? You know, mm -hmm. and um, the um, which is even more so now. The Italians were in Eritrea for longer, I believe, and so there's more of that cool Italian architecture there, I believe. Yeah, it's um, it, that's one of the most bizarre things that I had to look into the origins because for the longest I didn't understand, and and even now there's a lot more I have to read about it. But basically, there's nothing bad until the 1500s. You know, from pre prehistory to the 1500s, it's all good. It's all ours. You know, Mises even has a a piece on it called um, the Ash Heap of History of how great it was. You know, until the 500s or something. And and like everywhere else in that time period, the Ottoman Turks take over two port cities on the Red Sea because it's ah. important. And then my peoples, who are you know distantly related to me there, they pull back to the highlands. And right. somehow that th when the Ottomans, you know, lose and, and their empire dissipates in the 1800s, the British take control of that area. And instead of rendering it back to Ethiopia, it gets in Italian hands. And so some of the animosity between Eritreans and Ethiopians is because there is a unique, more, more colonial history between the Ottomans, the British and the Italians of Eritrea. Right, right, right. You know, whereas, whereas, you know, Ethiopia proper is penetrated in many ways by foreign influence. Uh, mm -hmm. There's this bizarre punitive addition, uh, you know, expedition, uh, you know, against the Theodore. Um, and um, the whole, I mean, that whole episode is just like explaining that war to like the modern world. Like, why is anyone doing any of these things? It's um, Game of Thrones, it, man. The period that he took over was Game of Thrones. I would oh, love yes, you yes. Know, to produce a yes, movie I mean, or something on that. 
Oh, I mean, within within the the you know, first of all, you have the Ethiopian politics there, and then you have the bizarre sort of British politics that are like, oh well, you know, somebody insulted or took prisoner, I guess, you know, so and so, so we're going to send an army there and mm -hmm. then fight them and then leave, you know, um, you know, the idea of the punitive expedition, you know, is totally alien to modern thought, and so you have this like it's this conflict of these just you know, if you made a movie about that now, of course, you'd have to include, you know, you'd want it, you know, I mean, first of all, you're not talking about a movie, you're talking about a mini series. Yeah. Uh, you know, and secondly, you've got, um, you know, just these um, very medieval Ethiopian politics going on. And then you've got, you know, this imperialist politics that, of course, no one knows anything about, you know, mm -hmm. today. Um, and, um, you know, it's just, this world of completely alien mindsets but of course you know ethiopian um i mean ethiopian feudal like whenever i've read about like ethiopian feudal politics like it's it's all a game of thrones i mean it's all oh, yeah uh, um uh, or the early travelers to ethiopia who would be like um you know i guess there was some story i don't know if this was true that um ethiopians would like cut live steaks off of cows to to eat them raw which doesn't seem like a good animal you know uh we, we do that to this day i I, really? I don't know i don't know when exactly it started the, the gurage tribe is one of the mm -hmm. many semitic tribes it's it's weird because it's a semitic tribe but it's in the south and and some people say they came from the Tigray region. It's it's not entirely clear to me, but they're but very. But they actually unique. they actually do this. They actually cut live steaks off of live cows, and then they stay alive somehow. Or I mean, I, when eat, I eating raw Harar, meat is one thing. Yeah, yeah. sorry. Go on. When I was in Harar, I I saw a cow get slaughtered. You know, and I ended up eating donuts for breakfast, lunch, and dinner for a, a week. <laughs> this is a guy who loves, <laughs> who loves meat, but it was just brutal because it was still alive for like six minutes. You know, as they're stabbing wow. it. Um, but yeah, I don't think they're eating it immediately. Like there's something, there's some spicing or they hung up the yeah. meat right where we were sleeping too. So right, you know, right, that, right, that right, right. And the culture is, is there, but I don't know about like, while it's alive, they're eating, you know, that, yeah. that might be, <laughs> yeah. some of, that, that, you know, that, 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 that's, 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 yeah, that's like an early European traveler thing where, um, yeah. you know, but, um, um, but it was definitely, you know, it the the fascination of the europeans with you know the land of prester john or whatever it is you know basically um you know they just to, just discovering this christian kingdom that's basically been cut off from the rest of christianity by the arab world you know which is what i mean because communication between kind of highland ethiopia and the west was like non-existent basically for i mean a millennium or something right i mean for a long that... time it would happen exclusively through the monks in jerusalem from about uh -huh. the three to four hundreds we have had a almost unbroken chain of monks living in jerusalem throughout all that time and a lot of this time was under the jurisdictional vassalage to the Egyptian Copts. But right. since Emperor Haile Selassie, we've, we've had our own jurisdiction since about the, the 40s and 50s. Um, but yeah, for, for millennia, we've had monks in Jerusalem. It's theorized that even the Armenian alphabet came about from meeting with and seeing the script uh -huh. used by the Ethiopian monks that were in uh, Jerusalem. So I didn't know that. So the Amharic script is actually Armenian in origin? No, 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 no. So um, no language has its own script in Ethiopia except Ge'ez. So Amharic right. uses the Ge'ez script, Tigrinya uses right. Ge'ez script, Guraginya and Oromo have pr predominantly oral languages, but when it did, they would use the Ge'ez script. Nobody else has a script. And what's and the origin uh, of the Ge what's the origin of the Ge'ez script? The Ge'ez script um still debatable, but they say it comes from Sabaean and south semitic and ah, would be the, the hieroglyphs that would have been in in the yemen area today and then that itself comes from the proto sinaitic which is the you know whatever the original semitic pictographic script um between you, egypt yeah, and the you you have all this this pre-islamic you know history that's lost and you know the sabians are are very interesting uh you know people um a while ago i got um sort of caught up in this um interesting uh uh, alternate research um, about um, 
uh, Rhodesia and Zimbabwe, and specifically the theory, which I think tend to think on balance is correct, that um, basically probably around in the, in the first millennium, um, there was probably a lot of Sabaean colonization and gold mining in that area mm -hmm. because that whole area is full of um, abandoned gold mines where nobody knows who, who built this, but it was probably, you know, Rhodesia is probably the, the Ophir of the Bible. Um, and, um, you know, clearly a lot of gold came out of that, that area. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also probable that although, you know, the, the history of, of Great Zimbabwe has become very uh, politicized, it's probable that that was some sort of colonial fortification from those people. There's a tribe, the Lemba, um, in that yeah. area who have... Um, identifiable semitic ancestry and traditions um, uh, <laughs> yeah 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 you know they're they're sort of you know um um you know uh, obviously the whole semitic complex you know containing jews and arabs and and you know amhara sort of springs out of there's this very kind of deep roots of civilization in that area <laughs> um and so you know i don't know if it's sort of controversial in Ethiopia to basically say Amharic came from kind of proto-Sinaitic and came from that Sabaean area, but it just seems basically yeah. right to me. It, uh, I mean, it's you'll, you'll talk to people who are otherwise very intelligent, who believe that Adam and Eve spoke Guz, that the angels right. speak Guz, that Guz right. is the language of God. You know, part of the issue is the word Guz has multiple meanings, and one of the meanings is first. So, you know, they come mm -hmm. up with these like false etymologies where, oh, it must be the first language because it means first, you right. know? So yeah, the right. script, right. I think unequivocally amongst rigorous scholars is unequivocally agreed upon that the script comes from, you know, this South Semitic branch that eventually leads back to Proto-Sinaitic because that's just the history of Aleph Bet, which itself right. is a Semitic yeah. word. Oh yeah, um, yeah. I mean, Carthage, Carthage is Semitic, you know, um, mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's like um, um, the uh, my my favorite example of this is you know you've heard about you know Carthage and 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 Moloch, right? You know, and um, if you meet a black dude named Malik, you know, it means king. Obviously, it's uh -huh. the same word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, yep. uh, a lot of people don't know. know that. Uh, from and, the and that's uh, you know, and and that's of course a cognate with with. Um, um, you know, Hebrew and mm -hmm. um, some people um, joke that MLK's family knew that and intentionally named him MLK for that reason. MLK, because of course, uh, you know, then of course, in Semitic languages, you don't, I don't know if this is in Gez, but in Gez, do you write the the vowels? We, you know? we do, we do, yeah. and we're weird that we read left to right, whereas every other Semitic reads right to left. So the script is definitely from that where there's argument and there's not clear scholarship between all the rigorous. And I spoke even with a, a Sephatic scholar recently about this point, and he was on yeah. another podcast, is where's the origin of Semitic languages? Semitic is a part of the larger Afro-Asiatic branch, yeah. and every other Cushitic language is in Africa. And then there are a bunch of Semitic languages in Ethiopia, but then there are a lot, you know, in the Middle East and the Near East. So it either comes from, you know, like Mesopotamia or Yemen or Ethiopia. And there's no clear one answer where exactly, you know, Semitic yeah, languages. I mean, there, there's, there's been a lot of, a lot of back, sort of back migration to the African continent mm -hmm. from, um, the, the Middle East. And that's not a new, that's, that's something that's been happening for sort of a very long time. And so, you know, you see these, these Cushitic languages, which are distant cousins of the Semitic mm -hmm. basically group. And you're basically like, yeah, you know, the, um, you know, the concept of, of sort of, I mean, the, the concept of a continent is an essentially modern concept. Yeah. And, you know, people have been moving around there considerably, you know, for a long time, you know, when you look at, you know, just Ethiopians physically, you see that there's sort of some sub-Saharan, you know, ancestry. And there's also a lot of like early European farmer type ancestry. And, you know, it's, and, and it's sort of a very deep mix. It's like Ethiopians don't really look like if you meet, you know, you might say, well, I look at your face and you're like, okay, maybe you're have in the distant past, like 
15 or 20 percent sub-saharan ancestry and then the rest sort of looks european semitic but you don't look like someone who is just a sort of recent cross of those <laughs> no and when i did the 23 and me data because that's what i was most curious about you know some of the ways uh, they say it is like you know the amhara and the tigray are these these arab invaders who you know colonized these cushitic peoples and I'll, and i just frankly didn't believe it so i took a test to see and it's not the most exact science but in there it said that I was 66% Sub-Saharan African and then, mm -hmm. then like 30 something percent um, what the category was North African slash Middle Eastern. But when you broke it down, it was 0% Middle Eastern and it was all North African, whatever that means under their data. And so when you break it down, it's like 98% of my family history, according to their science that is admittedly slightly speculative, has been in Africa for 10,000 years. So even yeah. some of the talks about like the back migration, maybe 11,000 years ago or 12,000, like it's really hard. Like my parents are probably the first people in my family in 10,000 years to have left the continent um, yeah. and, on a permanent and, and, basis. And there's also, there's a strain of something in North Africa that's probably related to Bushmen. Um, you know, you see a little bit of that sort of almost Chinese look sometimes. Um, um, so there's all sorts of, I mean, African DNA is just this, this glorious mess, right? But you don't really look like someone who's 66% Nigerian or something, you know? Um, yeah, and, and, and that's, that's the an weird interesting. Thing. Yeah. And that's the weird thing. And then that's basically as that's a result of, you know, there's a lot of genetic drift. There's a lot of selection. One of the things that happens in aristocracies is they tend is sexual selection tends to create selection for light skin. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, and so you basically get this, um, you sort of get this, um, like, you know, when you see aristocracies sort of select for this princess phenotype, they're almost like they're sort of turning into purebred dogs. They're basically selecting for these just almost exaggerated sexual characteristics. And one of those is light skin and females. Right. And so, you know, and, and, you know, another obviously is IQ. And so you basically, you know, it's like, I mean, the 10,000 years, like, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in those 10,000 years too. Mm -hmm. And evolution tends to happen more rapidly in aristocracies just because they, they're getting into artificial selection territory, basically. Uh, I mean, you know, humans think at least as hard about, you know, how to breed each other as how to breed animals. Um, they have fewer generations. And so you're just, you know, you become this. Um, and then of course you have sort of gene culture co-evolution, and so, you know, you have these sort of traditions that are adapted to people who have certain kinds of personality types. And it's just, just sort of, you get this or, sort of organic whole. And then to basically come in and, you know, say to this organic whole, oh, we're going to take everyone who scores, you know, this high in standard test tests and send them to Harvard and turn them into Americans. And, you know, I'm just like, why? It's, it's a waste of the the resources that have been developed. You know, the human capital, as people sure. Would say, and 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 one thing, one time. thing, one thing that I've learned from you that I didn't really understand is this. You know, that um um I mean, and I I should have expected this, but you know, you have this the same separation that you see in Europe between the clerical and the noble castes, and they're mm -hmm. related, but they're not quite the same people no. really exactly either, right? You know, um, uh, do Ethiopian priests marry? Is it a celibate? Yeah, they, yeah there's yeah. both. There's both. There's yeah. a celibate class, which are the monks, and then there are the married priest class. Most of my dad's side were married priests, um, but some of them are monks too. We have a couple right. monks that are around now. The average priest is actually like looked down on traditionally and derided. Um, really? At the same, yeah. Uh, at the same time, the most educated people of all time are always people who have priestly education. Yes. So and those, there's like those... a, that's a difference within even the, the, the cleric, like there's the guy who does the mass and then there's the guy who goes through the indigenous university systems. That, right. That and, and, and all of these, all of these old priestly classes turn out to have basically bred, you know, themselves for like memorizing scriptures, you yeah. know, I mean, uh, I have a good friend who's a Tamil Brahmin, uh, you know, very similar thing, you know, these, these, these were 
like it was a hereditary job to be the one who memorized all of these scriptures and could recite them on, you know, the necessary occasions. And so same thing with the Jews in Eastern Europe, you know, you're basically breeding these people to perform these mental feats, right? You know, and so, yeah. you know, once you, once you have that, it's sort of easy to basically be like, oh, well, uh, you know, this person can do computer science, you know? Um, and, um, but that's this, like, when you take these people out of their countries and basically be like, oh, we're just going to, like, subtract everyone with an IQ over 110 from this country. It's just such a disaster, you know. Um, and um, it's sort of good to see, like, that recovering a little bit. A little in, bit. Like, a little bit. A little bit. But, you know, you're still, I mean, my God, imagine being able to go as a tourist to, like, 18th century Ethiopia. I mean, it would be like a wild, a wild experience. <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just that world yeah. is so completely lost. Um, and you know, one of the one of the sort of um like if you look at countries that took preserving their civilizations to a real extreme, um, you're looking at Japan with its Sokoku policy of like which was so extreme that if you were a Japanese fisherman mm -hmm. in like the you know early 19th century and you were like shipwrecked in California, Japan did not want you back wow. because it was like you are basically contaminated. And mm -hmm. you know, because they had this experience actually very early where um the Portuguese came and started, you know, spreading Christianity, and then they were like, We're gonna wipe this out with fire and the sword, right? You know, and they wiped it out with fire and the sword and um went to this model where even trade is sort of very, very restricted. And um the result was that, you know, even throughout most of the 19th century, before Commodore Perry arrives and is like, No, we want to sell you our cheap shit. Uh, so you got to open up to us. You had this intact medieval society. And, you know, to imagine what would have happened if, you know, Commodore Perry had been like, no, let's just leave this thing here. I mean, you'd have this intact medieval society in the 21st century, which would be just this incredible, like, it's like this lost treasure, right? And, you know, if you go to Japan today, you see pieces of that, you know, just as if you go to Ethiopia today, you'll see pieces of the old Ethiopia. And yeah. you can the cliffside monasteries and take the tours and i'm sure you know um um i mean i don't know that ethiopia is a major tourist destination but it's certainly at least a minor tourist destination and i'm pretty it's, sure you it's can up take there the people tour. trying to trace the the origin of the nile um people seeing the churches of of lalibela which you know show up on the history channel with that crazy alien haired greek guy <laughs> who's, uh, you know talking about was it ethiopians or was it aliens who built these yeah, uh, yeah, monolithic yeah, yeah. structures out of one stone there's some there's some story this is the decoration but there's some story um um there was like an italian um like uh, some kind of proconsul or something who was taking one of these tours and um, mm. he thought the monks had tried to kill him or something. And so <laughs> he, there was some at assassination attempt or what he thought he was an assassination attempt and it resulted in this, this sort of wave of, of persecutions, but not even, I mean, the Italians were only in Ethiopia for a few years. Uh, yeah. They were very energetic, but they didn't, you know, they didn't manage to destroy this stuff, and um, somehow it's the it lasted. Portuguese, like like you, the way you said the Portuguese and Japanese is, yeah. is fascinating yeah. to me. And you know, I grew up reading manga, watching anime, and I practice right. jujitsu, so I'm a little bit of a <laughs> Japanophile to the yeah. cinema too. But um, the Portuguese were the ones who came in the 1500s, and my last uh -huh. direct ancestor who was on the throne was converted to Catholicism by these Portuguese minister, um, ministers. Like, like they did the same thing that you said. They said, Orthodox Christianity is not real Christianity. Let's teach you Catholicism. They accused right. us of being Jewish because we did not eat pork. We honored the original Sabbath in addition to Sunday. We, right. you know, we and that must have caused some, some violence, uh, you know, I imagine. Huge. You know, yeah. Huge. Yeah. yeah. And, and reactionariness and from his son, who became the next and, and that. And that was eventually, I mean, Portuguese Catholicism did not survive or leave any traces in Ethiopia, right? Little, a little bit. <laughs> There's still a Catholic presence, but it's an extreme minority. They're, they're more Protestants. I'd have to check the numbers, but I'm pretty sure they're yeah. more Protestants. Yeah, because they were, they were, there was a reaction and they were basically kicked out. Right? Yeah. There's this old Amharic saying, and it's, it's so hilarious, but he's in like, you take it from the point of view of the Orthodox Christian. And they said, I'd rather deal with a Muslim than a Catholic. Because like they knew the Muslims, you know, and the Muslims had been around 
Oh, oh, can you hear me? Hey, I, I, lo I lost, I lost you there for a second. Can you repeat that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, there's an old Amharic saying that they would rather deal with Muslims than with Catholics. You know, and, <laughs> you know, and, and it's because yeah. like they they knew who they were. You know, you know, yeah, whatever right. Muslim oppression was there, it, it was more obvious, and you know, they're more familiar. Whereas, you know, the greater stranger or foreigner were were the the Portuguese who were coming there. Right, right, right. So, so as as an Ethiopian Orthodox, you basically um, do you find yourself you're closer to to Eastern Orthodoxy than to Catholicism, like in a historical sense, right? There's some there's a closer tie there. Is that true? Um, correct, only because the Catholic Church kept changing and changing, but we're our own separate communion. So we're right. the the Afro Asiatic communion. So the people we're the closest to are the Copts, who are the inheritors, you know, of of the hieroglyphs. Although they abandoned it for the Greek script, and you know, for Pharaoh, the, you know, for all intents and yeah, purposes, yeah, the, yeah. the descendants of Pharaoh, and then the Syriac, who are the you know indigenous Aramaic speakers, Syriacs, the written Aramaic, and then the Armenians and right. um, so a there's small like group a, of Kerala Indians as well. There's like a Nestorian connection. Is there? Not a Nest the Nestorian, yeah. Even 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 the Appalachian Nestorian is, is a lot of bad history. The Assyrian Church <laughs> of the East, but there's similarities with the Assyrian right. Church of the East, um, via via the tradition of interpreting the Bible. Um, but we were with the West Syriac, and the the, the so-called Nestorians were the Eastern Syriac. Right. So we have some similar sources. Particularly, there's a saint called. Isaac the Syrian, who is a quote unquote Nestorian saint, whom whom everyone actually acknowledges. Um, but he's just, you know, so prolific and 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 so well written. Everyone got him. And that's a major part of our monastic education in Ethiopia. So that's our connection to them. Um, but we're closer to the the ones in Syria more than the ones in Persia. So the the ones right. in Syria were closer to Byzantium. The ones in Persia were, like they actually fled to the Persian Empire when they were getting persecuted around that stuff. So they Interesting. were like, out of that. It's sort of it's it's so fascinating that sort of all of these are just like pieces of, you know, as a Christian, you're a piece of the antique world that has somehow survived into the modern world, um, and you know that's, um, you know, there's something incredible about that. And then to have survived, you know, it's like you're a piece of the antique tradition that doesn't flow through the west at all no. um and and has in fact you know survive survive the west and it, it's sort of interesting to see when you see um you know obviously i know a lot of uh you know traditionalists and mm -hmm. um you know they tend to there's the set of people who have Return to Catholicism is, of course, pretty non-trivial. But there's also a pretty large number of Eastern Orthodox converts, mm -hmm. and yep. you know, I think that's largely because of Vatican II, essentially. Um, yeah. And um, um, you know, I don't know, like, I don't. I mean, you know, as a you know, non non-Christian, you know, when I look at say. Um, Pope Francis or something. I'm like, this man is a Protestant. Like, I'm <laughs> sorry, you have a Protestant Pope. This is yeah. a serious problem, right? You know, I'm not saying, but I'm saying, and I don't, I don't think that that ever, that sort of, you know, neo-Protestantism ever really happened. I'm sure there's strains of it in Eastern Orthodoxy, yeah. and I'm sure there were sort of various attempts to create a Protestant, an effectively Protestant Ethiopian church, but uh, did they ever get anywhere? Did they like? They're around now and, and they're growing. You know, our church has lost 20 million people since the 90s. They did a report, the, the, the Holy Synod, which is the Council of Bishops. They did a report on it, but it's a lot of, you know, vague reasons. It's not, it's not clear, you know, why it's, you know, it's more emotional. Sure. It's, it's easier. It's the services are shorter. You know, our, our services are notoriously ridiculous three to four times a month. It's 8 PM to 10 AM. Um, wow. that, yeah. that's, <laughs> <you know? laughs> that's, that's, that's some serious religion. Well, you know, I guess one, one, the, the, um, um, I sort of also sense that, um, sort of because of the Marxist roots of the Ethiopian, the present Ethiopian regime, that the trick of basically saying, of kind of turning back to religion in the same way that Putin has and saying, we're going to actually use this as a prop 
of the regime hasn't really happened in Ethiopia. So it's more like you have this sort of traditional church. Uh, I'm just like, you know, one of the sort of the West, the Western idea of separation of church and state, um, you know, doesn't, well, it doesn't necessarily really work, you know, um, and it just, it leads to this basically atheistic state, essentially. And um, <clears throat> again, very, very difficult thing for me to accept given my, you know, basically Marxist, you know, uh, American upbringing, right? You know, but yeah. um, when you basically try to have a traditional church without a state that is sort of leaning on it in some sense, these churches always seem to kind of wither because the relationship between temporal and spiritual power um, is, I think, really actually important. Um, you know, I was just seeing the footage of like, you know, the the Russian Ministry of Defense has just built this like giant cathedral, you know, basically <laughs> for like, you know, like yeah. yeah, after after, you know, they're like, oh, let's build it, let's build the, you know, this will be the, like the cathedral of the Russian Navy or some 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 yeah. crazy shit like that. And I'm I'm and it's sort of built in this um um, there's like drone footage of it. You can find this somewhere. It's sort of built in this um style, which is like it's kind of a Warhammer 40k style. It's like kind of, you know, modern but traditional in this way uh -huh. that's really kind of unique. And RKO futuristic. Yeah, it's kind of RKO futuristic, you know, and and it's not like a replica of a medieval building, but it's sort of built with the same stylistic kind of um, you know, values as a medieval building, which is kind of interesting. And um sort of the ability to kind of rediscover this as a prop of a modern of a 21st century state is sort of is sort of interesting but i get i, I sort of gather that relationships between you know the the new government and the old church in ethiopia are not quite that integrated uh, it, i was it, it would be surprised so we had this feud for 27 years it's one of many things the current prime minister has done you know he, he's a very interesting guy his mm -hmm. father is an Oromo Muslim. His mother is an Amharic speaking Orthodox Christian. Now and this he's is a Protestant. Uh, this is this is not Zanawi. This is the replacement no. of Zanawi. This is the guy who replaced After Zanawi. Zanawi is a guy named uh, HD, uh Haile Mariam Dasaling, and he was, you know, more of a puppet figure. And then after him, the current guy is named Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed. He's the one who who who, who ended the, the war. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And another thing right. he did is he said he was coming to to reconcile. We had two competing synods or council of bishops, one in Ethiopia and one in here because of the proximity with the government, which they said was a secular government. And he right. said he's on his way. While he was on his way, the bishops who are all really old men said, this mm -hmm. is embarrassing for a 40 year old man to come, you know, reconcile us. And so they reconciled on their own while he was flying right. to America. Right. So he had involvement in that. And, and being, though he's a, a Protestant, you know, like Putin and Assad, he kisses the, the you know, the icon he, he, or the cross, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, like, respects yeah. it. That's what makes does him he, different. Does he intend to rule for life? Does he, uh, I mean... He says he's going to step down. You know, he's made, like, a Department of Peace, which is interesting. That's his, his education background, and it seems like he wants to move into something like that. But he's also still running for election. The elections were d delayed because of uh, COVID. You know, it's interesting uh, you right. mentioned the Japanese yeah. earlier and the, the remnants of the the wisdom of the old society. And I, I think about how how they addressed COVID. And I know you've written some some thoughts yeah. about this. Too, how did they address we'll COVID? Tell, 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 <laughs> tell, tell me about the Ethiopian approach to COVID. Um, well, from the people, you know, this is very anecdotal from the people that sure. I've spoken to who live there right now. It seemed like a lot of people weren't taking it seriously at first. And, uh, you know, they were just kind of continuing. But all the religious figures, like the major Islamic leaders, Orthodox Christian leaders, Protestants and Catholics got together and they closed down. They cooperated with the government and they did like national prayer on TV. Um, which that right. has not been done in like 30 years. So, <laughs> so that's <laughs> right, definitely right, like a, right. an homage yeah. to what was before. Right. Um, right. And, um, and and that came from the bishop who ordained me. He, he made that request and the prime nice. minister, um, he, he answered that request. Uh, but now the numbers do seem to be spiking up, whereas Eritrea, I think, had a peak of about 40. And then they said they wiped out the cases, but now they say they have two cases. And again, that's more of a hermit kingdom than Ethiopia is. Yeah, yeah, Ethiopia, yeah. I don't know the exact numbers now, but they seem to be going up. And, you know, I, 
I, I frankly don't know what to believe. I read a lot and appreciate, you know, I don't know if you know our WRI Twitter or Nassim Nicholas Taleb Twitter. And yeah, yeah, I yeah. know like, you know, it, it's so we have to be so cautious about the things that we don't know. We even know to yeah. quote Rumsfeld. And at the same time, we, we don't want to just keep ceding power to, um, this oligarchy that is there. Yeah. So it's, it's <laughs> really, it's, 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 it's really, it's really tough with COVID because, uh, you know, it's like, I know there, there are people that I respect who are basically in the, in the let it rip category. There are people who I respect. I tend to favor more the let's kill the whole thing, but you end up with these, you know, the same thing that's been going on here where you basically do this lockdown and you just don't have the stamina to do it all the way to get to zero. And even the Chinese are having, they're having another spike now. Like they're getting to zero is really, really hard, but getting to like, you know, you know, we seem to be about to go through this thing where you get almost to zero and then people forget about it and then it comes roaring back. And I think, you know, the, I uh, probably will get a vaccine early next year, but it's very, very difficult to prevent this sort of pattern of, 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 of repeating. Um, but, you know, it's certainly true that COVID in a way is a kind of test of the cohesion of the government and kind of strength of every society. And you basically see, it's like when you look, when you compare continental Europe to the Anglo-American world, um, Anglo-American places like New Zealand and Australia that are very isolated have done reasonably well with the COVID. Mm -hmm. um, the UK and the US, which are these super cosmopolitan societies that are sort of very relatively ungoverned, have done much worse than continental Europe. Um, and the thing is what continental Europe has, even a country like Italy has this kind of Napoleonic heritage of authoritarianism where they can sort of fall back into the mode of, okay, we will tell you what to do and everyone will obey and we will beat this thing together, which mm -hmm. of course, you know, China has, you know, the Maoist authoritarianism where, you know, they're like, it's very like China, you know, what Maoism created was this very tight, very Chinese style fabric of kind of local governance where, you know, every like apartment block has its own little party cell that governs it. And so it's very easy for China to basically establish sort of complete population control. And one of the things that you're sort of finding is that there are third world countries that are actually better at controlling their population than the West. And then, mm -hmm. then the U.S., you know, where it's like the idea that I don't think anyone in Ethiopia really doubts the idea that the government is in charge of the country and has the right to tell them what to do. And that's not a thing that is really widely believed here in the United States. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and so, like, you know, when you have this situation where you know, libertarianism just doesn't work and government is required, you know, um, um, maybe you heard me, I think I, I used this metaphor on, on Thad Russell's, you know, podcast where it's like, you know, the pencil standing on its point, um, you know, libertarianism and even anarchism sort of works when you're in this, um, you know, when the pencil is actually standing upright on its point, it takes very little energy to hold it upright. Um, but when the pencil falls over, it takes much more energy to set it back upright. Imagine that your pencil is the size of a telephone pole, right? You could hold that telephone pole. If you're standing on a ladder next to a telephone pole, you could hold it at top dead center with your hand mm -hmm. because very little force is required to, to maintain that unstable equilibrium. But the thing is always going to fall over if you let go of it because it is an unstable equilibrium. And if it falls over, you can't lift it up. You need heavy machinery to get back to that top dead center position. And so it's sort of these exceptional cases in which, you know, you sort of see this need for a level of governance that says, no, 
because we're in this biological emergency of this biological epidemic, we're going to actually have to tell you to stay in your house and the army is going to bring you food, you know, and, and the U S never, it always had this sort of weak lockdown. It never got to the point where it said, we're going to just eradicate this disease completely. Even China, it doesn't, China's having a they don't seem to have quite managed to get to zero, um, which seems like it should be something that's that's biologically possible. Um, but in the U.S., it's just nowhere near politically politically possible. And so you see, you know, in situations like that, you sort of see the virtues of the like Eritrean style of government, right? <laughs> and then for the rest of for the rest of life, you see the vices of the Eritrean style of government yeah. and the ability to basically say, "Hey, you know." Maybe you could have a system that's as authoritarian as it needs to be when it needs to be, but only when it needs to be. And, you know, the rest of the time, you know, we're going to have as much anarchy as, as possible because anarchy is like anarchy is also beautiful. I mean, this is this mm -hmm. is the, um, um, you know, like you can't, you know running a modern society like like sparta or like you know um uh, the incas or something um where it's just this complete total state in some ways the incas were like the closest to like bizarre postmodern soviet dystopia in the pre-modern world um and that's also you know sort of somewhat horrifying um and it's like i think that people have sort of been taught by their kind of Western way of thinking that, you know, these are separate alternatives and either, you know, if you're going to have a government that's really sovereign, it's going to look like Eritrea, it's going to mm -hmm. look like, you know, Sparta or something. And then, um, you know, the alternative is kind of anarchy and chaos in New York City in the 70s. <laughs> um, and, yeah. you know, neither of those things is really, it seems desirable to me and the question of how to basically have i mean what capitalism is what anarchy is is a sort of controlled chaos that is not actually sort of dangerous i mean and the chinese with you know this sort of combination of we're going to maintain complete social order <coughs> but in the productive economy it's just going to be this insane like there's no well i mean Chinese capitalism is extremely underregulated, right? I mean, mm -hmm. they have intellectual property. Like, like Singapore, Singapore as well. Yeah. Sing yeah. You know, and uh, Singapore isn't underregulated, you know, and so, you, but Singapore is a little over domesticated, maybe, you know, it's like, okay, you want a little more excitement, a little more craziness, you know, you want, um, you know, young people have to get, at least get this out of their system. You right. know, um, don't go to jail for life for weed. Don't get beat yeah, up for yeah, chewing gum. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like one one society that's, um, um, you know, um, mastered sort of this ability to remain traditional in the modern world really well is, of course, the Amish. Mm. Um, and you know, there was a study. I, the Amish are really very, I, you know. Uh, uh, archaeofuturist in a way there were, and there was a study that I read a few years ago that was a study of like self-reported like satisfaction in life like how happy are you as a person and the happiest people in the world it turned out from this study were billionaires and then right after the billionaires was the hair behind the billionaires Amish right yeah. you know? <laughs> and and so and one of the things they do I don't know if you if you know about this but um one of the kind of Amish responses to modernity of do you know the word rumspringa no I don't <laughs> so if you grow up if you if you grow if you grow up Amish so you're growing up in this traditional society. You don't go to school after eighth grade. You basically are, are being, sort of being prepared to live in this pre-industrial way. And then what they say to you when you're basically at like the oh, end of high school is I, basically- I know what you mean. I didn't know the yeah, term. I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. They're basically like, go out. Hey, yeah. you know what? <laughs> you want to live out. in like, try it yeah. out. You want to live in this whole- yeah. And you know, one of the things that's interesting historically is that- um, you know, they, it's possible to track the rates at which people return to the Amish community. So after if you basically go in this, after that, after that trial period. So in the sixties, it was as low as like, you know, 60% would return, you know, like a lot of people were like, screw it. Want to live in the modern world. Right. And now it's like well over 90%. The other thing that's interesting about this way of doing things is if you decide as a teenager, 
that you don't want to be Amish. That's fine. You still can basically see your family. You still, they're like, you know, you'll come for events or whatever. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, you're, you've got went out and joined, you know, the, the English people, you know, um, if you decide you're going to be Amish and then come back to the Amish and then change your mind, nobody can ever see you again. It's like, basically, once you make that choice, you know, you're in it for life. And, yeah. and that's a, that's a serious, like the, that's a serious you say commitment. Sokoku? Was it similar to uh, that? Uh, so Sokoku. Well, that was a Sokoku. national policy, but yeah. you know, um, but it's still the same. It's like, you need, um, you know, things to, to sort of retain their identity and their like character need to be isolated from each other. You can't basically say, oh, you know, half the time you're going to be an Ethiopian, you know, monk, you know, studying gaze and the other half of the time you're going to be at like Burning Man doing acid. You know, <laughs> that just doesn't that just doesn't work, you know. And 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 so like and and you know maybe there's some people that that can contain sort of multitudes at that level, but that's not a normal human thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you're going to have these traditional cultures, you sort of need to have a way to work out. Okay, you're going to live in the modern world. You know, it's still the 21st century, but it's like no, we're not all going to be in this sort of Western, West, fully Westernized hellhole. And that's you know. That's something that I think is a lot of a lot of people are still working out. But of course, in a way, in the diaspora, you probably see that more clearly than someone living in Ethiopia, because someone living in Ethiopia still is going to have this like inferiority complex, the sense of like looking up to the Western world. Whereas growing up in L.A., you basically like you've actually had the chance to become fully a fully Westernized person and actually rejected that consciously, which is a very different thing. It bugs um, people. It really, it really <laughs> bugs people because that archaeo futurism, I'd never yeah. put it that way. The way I had put it before is I used to tell people I'm a primitivist and a technologist, a radical and a traditionalist. Yeah. You yeah, know, yeah. Uh, so, and, so the way you phrased it is another way of making it explicit. And I've had people from my father to other people look at me and they're like, you know, um, you know, you graduated with a master's, you're you you're here, like this is the dream where everyone's trying to right. go. Why would you go to these backward institutions? Like that's what they always yeah. say. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 it's like, you know, actually the people that are um to me, the people that have the opposite of that view and are basically like, no, everything must be modern. You know, it's mm -hmm. like it's actually very parochial in a way because you're essentially you're you're a backward person. When you do that, you're a backward person in the face of history in a way, because yes. what you're basically saying is. I can't understand the rest of history. And, you know, you see it now with these people ripping down these statues. It's like, you know, it's, it's sort of becomes, it goes from being this specific thing about, oh, this person, that person to be just like, I hate the past and I fear it and I don't understand it. And that's that, that's actually the attitude of a very backward barbarian. Um, and so, you know, it's this attitude of like the parochial attitude is the sense of, of, of sort of, unconsidered superiority and you know it's like you're you know you you meet this native tribe like somewhere they're in some distant jungle or whatever and they think they're the center of the universe mm -hmm. and they're like you know i'm sorry i realize that the name of your tribe means the people and the name of your god <laughs> means the only god but you know actually like you're really backward you know um and so you know it's the height of the, hubris like it's the it's the height of hubris right and way. so and 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 you know what's what's i mean the thing is that it's much easier to understand the level of confidence these people had in themselves um 50 60 70 years ago because 50 60 70 years ago it was basically like you know you could see these people and they would be like look everything we do works you know, we, we go to the moon, we get to the moon, you know, um, um, allegedly. we, uh, allegedly, <laughs> 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 we, we, uh, we, 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 we eradicate malaria, see the malaria is gone. You know, we perform this miracle, we perform that miracle and, you know, everything is, is happy and it works better now. And, um, then, you know, as you start to see the cracks in this sort of modernity and you're like, wow, this is really not working at all for a lot of people. And, and, 
and you realize, especially, you know, modernity is, I think modernity works very well for basically a certain kind of nobility. I think it would be hard to basically look at, say, Burning Man and say, you know, which is basically a festival of Western nobles and basically <laughs> say, uh, um, um, and basically, basically say, well, this is not working for you. It's clearly working for them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but can it work for everybody? <sighs> no, I don't really think so. And, you know, could, you know, yeah, sure. Okay. Burning Man works for you, but like, you know, uh, as a noble, but, you know, is there a world where you'd be, you know, much happier, um, you know, being a cardinal of the Catholic church or riding a horse with a lance and like, you know, sticking it through barbarians, you know, mm -hmm. maybe that would actually be much more fulfilling to you than doing acid at Burning Man. But you know what? That is just beyond as beyond your world is like going to the moon is for some primitive tribe. Yeah. Um, and so in a way when you're, um, you know, reading Gez, uh, you know, uh, instead of, uh, you know, studying uh, <laughs> Marxist, uh, you know, <laughs> Marxist philosophy or something. Yeah. It's like you've, 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 you've sort of lucked into this old technology um, that is actually like, you know, quick, these people look at you. On that, yes. it, the reason it bugs them the most is like traditional English academics, you know, have the Latin Greek yeah. background and that's in all the prefixes and suffixes and all the roots of the words. Giz is that to Amharic. And so of course, in some ways I have surpassed their native Amharic speaking right. capabilities with Giz, which they have forsaken and looked right. down upon. And I'm doing this as someone who's been born and raised fully outside of Ethiopia. And that yes. really bugs them. Like I've and seen some of them really get mad about that. Yeah, because they basically have this, like you know, um, um, you know, there's this, you know, almost great chain of being thing that they that people who are these rice Christians go on, where they're like, okay, at the top of the great chain of being is Harvard, and then <laughs> everything backward and weird and like you know, um, um, is beneath that, and mm -hmm. it's just like, yeah, no, this isn't like this isn't right this isn't real um and uh, there's a great line in uh in the young pope which you really should see uh you know oh. where uh dude where, i've been taking where... notes i got notes from the hyenas bella uh belly and the young pope and then i didn't catch carl the historian you said about the forest carl fire. carl carl uh, um um Carl Jasper's The Axial Age. Was that the, uh, yeah. um, um, and, um, yeah, if, if there's a great line in the young Pope where, um, you know, someone, uh, says to, uh, you know, to Jude law, someone is like, well, Harvard recommends this. And he's like, you know, when I hear the word Harvard, all I, all I think of is decadence. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, and it has oh. exactly the same, it has exactly the same effect on these basically people who sort of think of themselves as traditional, but have come to still think of Harvard as the top of the world. Mm -hmm. You know, to basically hear that rejected with confidence is like <laughs> what's neat about about seeing that on HBO is that basically it's on HBO because it's fresh and people mm -hmm. don't understand why. Here's this freshness. Why? What is? Why is this fresh? You know, this guy is trying to uh, eradicate homosexuals from the Catholic Church. How can that be fresh? You know, and yet it's fresh. And you know, somehow someone acknowledged that it's fresh. And uh, um, um, yeah, what definitely def that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but you know, I like see, I like I like seeing it on television. All right, well, I should I should run, but uh, this yeah. has been a, this has been this has been hugely fun. Can you send me uh, -huh. uh can you send me a uh, you know a link to this um and I'll yes uh, I'm I'll I'm definitely sure, uh, gonna do that. I I have one if you if you have one more minute. I, I one do the, I do. One of the things from hearing you speak that I love the most and. Um, you don't have to get into your metaphysics if if you don't want to, but I'd be curious, you know, what your, you know, what is if if anything, you know, the religious tradition that that you'd feel most proximity to. And the reason I ask that is like when people like Tom Holland study some of the, you know, pre-Judeo Christian, um, mm -hmm. you know, you know, societies and the lack of respect for you know human dignity and things like that 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 you've discussed versus you know the the traditions that that built upon it. 
uh, one of the two of the things that stuck out to me the most about what you said, one with Justin Murphy, where you said that health was your primary goal as opposed to some random utilitarian or consequentialist goal. It's like specifically sure. like the health. And then the second is like your theory of compliance uh, is basically the biblical teaching of Jesus Christ in terms of rendering unto Caesar, like straight oh, yeah. up. And I've only ever met, I've met a lot of preachers. I've only ever met two preachers, one who's a close mentor and one, one who's a distant, you know, acquaintance who have ever had the same exact position. They didn't use the word compliance, but it, it's exactly what you said. And they got it from interpreting. Oh, it's, I mean, it's, it's straight, it's straight in the Bible. And, and the, um, um, this is, I mean, you know, like, like it's sort of Jesus, the politician, you know, in a way, um, I mean, and the specific anecdote where he basically takes the coin and mm -hmm. he's basically like, whose face is on this coin? Yeah. Is it God's face? No, yeah. you know, and, 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 and that, that sort of, I mean, you know, certainly Jesus is not the only one to mm -hmm. come up with this idea. It's a true idea. And the thing the thing about truth is that, you know, when you see a lie that's basically shared in two places, you're like, OK, this got copied from one of these places to the other. But, mm -hmm. you know, truth isn't like that. Like anybody can find it, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, so the uh, yeah, I mean. The thing is that being from this, um, you know, having grown up in this, this sort of completely, uh, I grew up sort of very much in the in the American leading tradition, basically, as sort of a an atheistic Cold War liberal, you know, a universalist, really under that, mm -hmm. and um, and and sort of without realizing of course that it's a secularized christianity um you know but that <laughs> was basically yeah 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 but 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 the world of the secularized christianity was is was definitely the world that i grew up in and so you know um that is of course being secularized it's um you know easy to abandon because you don't have this personal relationship with the deity right mm -hmm. you know and so that um <clears throat> Just that that level of deracination. I mean, also have some some Jewish roots, but they go through communism. Uh, mm -hmm. That level of deracination, I think, makes it easier for me to have a sort of external aesthetic appreciation of these traditions and basically what they bring to people without actually being a member of any of, of them. And so mm -hmm. the thing is that you're brought, I mean, the tradition that I was brought up in was very, it had this sort of anti-clerical component, right? It had this, um, um, you know, uh, someone said somewhere, uh, you know, anti-Catholicism is the anti-Semitism of the intellectuals. And it's really not just anti-Catholicism, it's anti-clericalism in general. It's this rivalry almost with this, between, you know, this new, you know, deracinated form of Christianity that we don't even know is Christianity and these older forms of Christianity. And so when you look at the older forms and basically how they work, you're just like, wait a minute, this is a working system and you just broke it. It's like, you know, when you look at modern Catholics, one of the things, I think even traditionalists, one of the things that somehow disappeared from Catholicism and from the rest of Christianity is this ritual of confession. Like, I don't think even the traditionalist Catholics really do that much anymore. And I'm just like, this is something that is like, so obviously, first of all, the sort of the relationship to modern psychotherapy is kind of, you know, yeah. hilarious, you know, because yeah. you're like, yeah, actually, this is like, I, I'm pretty sure this actually works better than Freud, you know, um, maybe they're, uh, you know, Freud isn't exactly the most scientific psychiatry in the world. But mm -hmm. um, I'm like, here you have this, this thing that is just like, so obviously, an effective system, and you're basically throwing it away, because it's old. And, um, you know, and, and that's just like this sort of massive mistake in a way. And so, you know, certainly, um, um, you know, if someone, um, you know, came to me, uh, you know, tomorrow and said that I had to convert to some kind of new state religion, I would be like, <laughs> great. Um, um, we've needed a state religion for a long time. And, you know, I would definitely prefer, uh, something, uh, highly ritualistic. Um, and, um, you know, because those things, those things work. And um, when you look at the 
predictions made for kind of the fate of Protestantism by Catholics in the 19th century, uh, they were basically dead on. Um, mm -hmm. You know, unfortunately, they didn't predict what would that even Catholicism would become Protestant for political reasons. Um, but yeah, you know, when you step outside sort of coming at these, you know, traditions from, you know, the perspective of someone who is sort of, you know, it's like, I'm not even a first generation atheist. I'm like a second or third generation atheist. And so mm -hmm. basically that sort of works all the poison out of the system in a way. And so it's much easier to grow up not hating religion in the sort of normal way that atheists hate religion because they're not really atheists. Yeah. They're really anti-theists, right? Um, and atheist so group. Yeah, no. Um, uh, no, I, I, I certainly remember thinking that way, right? You know, I certainly thought that way as a kid of mm -hmm. uh, having this, um, you know, you know how the Soviets actually turned uh, churches into museums of atheism? Um, <laughs> you know, uh, when people start talking about, oh, you know, the Spanish Inquisition. I'm like, All right, well, you know, actually, uh, you guys have some a little guilt here to work out, uh, you know, no. uh, yourselves. But yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of my, that's my my take. I can't really, you know, it's like I, I almost consider the idea of of raising my children in some kind of church, but I just don't mm -hmm. know that I could actually follow through with that. Um, you know, but it's certainly the um like this like anti-religious stuff is just just incredibly poisonous and evil. Um and um yeah, I, I see no reason to like I, I mean that that's just like it's as you know. It's it's like I I, I have um uh, one of uh, one 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 of my favorite books, which unfortunately I've sort of I've I've uh, I've fled inland because of the COVID, so I don't have my books. But um, mm -hmm. one of the you know uh, one of my great possessions is the 1911 uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, um, mm -hmm. and um, the. Uh, no, this is actually, this is an earlier entry. And one of my other positions is, is Chambers Encyclopedia from the 1870s. And this has an entry on atheism. And the entry on atheism, it basically describes it in the same terms that like racism would be described today. It would be basically just like atheism, you know, this is like the root of all evil. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it it's like clearly um, written in such a way that, when the people in the 19th century imagined what would be the world if what would the world be like if all our governments were atheistic and everyone was an atheist and i think they would picture something not too dissimilar to modernity in some ways mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. and, um um you know and and as as a person with a scientific mindset i have to you know uh have a lot of respect for predictions that come true and those are predictions that basically came true when people in the 19th century were like look if we're all atheists this is what it's going to look like they basically got it right to a substantial extent and so you can't really you can't really overlook that and you can't you know this idea to you know of creating like you know you have you go back to like robespierre and like the festival of reason and like these attempts to create these sort of pseudo religions out of science and stuff and That's it's all just it's all it just like it doesn't age well when you look at it and and you go back into the past you're just embarrassed by it it's uh, slow, i call it slow speed nihilism yeah, you know? yeah, yeah, and 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 it's just it's like the um, it just leads to these strange. I mean, you know, like when you look at it's like you know one one group that I'm sometimes associated with uh, is like the internet, you know, rationalists, you know, right? And I'm like, these are people that are, you know, it's it's a very deeply atheistic creed in a way, mm -hmm. and you're just like when you look at these. I mean, this is often very, very good people on very, very smart people. And yet you can't help but feel that in their ability to even sort of comprehend these traditional ways of thinking, it's almost like you're dealing with someone who's colorblind. You know, it's like, you know, you can't even, it's like they can't see the color red or something, you know? <laughs> They're missing yeah. this basic human sense. And yeah. It's like the I giver. Mean, I think that's like the premise of the giver, right? Right, right. The people have sort of lost this ability to, you know, um, um, 
Yeah, and and I mean, there's a reason why dystopias like this resonate so deeply with with kids is that they feel that they've lost this. And one of the things, you know, um, um, my own experience with basically raising kids in modernity, um, you know, not being religious and not sort of being able to kind of raise them in a sort of, um, you know, traditionally like you know, if you can raise kids in an environment that's sort of wholly traditional, that's great. Um, instead, what I've done with mine is just not indoctrinated them in anything, including in like the modern doxology, right? And it turns out that basically when you have smart kids, reasonably smart kids, and you don't indoctrinate them in like modern nonsense, mm -hmm. what happens is they look at the modern nonsense and they're like, what the hell? You know? <laughs> and, um, That's awesome. Like you really, you really have to, you have to work hard to get people to really believe in this stuff. And it turns out if you don't try to get them to believe in it, they basically automatically become to some extent traditionalists, even without any indoctrination in that direction um you know so you know I, I wouldn't be i wouldn't be surprised to see my kids become religious as adults like you know um and uh, that's so fascinating it, it happens like that it skips generations my grandparents generations uh -huh. my dad's side being from more of the clerics they were more deeply religious but they were never evangelical it was just you know right. it was like just an obvious statement of fact you know that right. they do these certain rituals you know as you described in my own grandmother my dad's father you know she passed away last year but she had like a 700 year old psalms of david which she memorized wow. better than her priestly you know cousins and brothers but my right. mom's side were the first generation of these people who started wearing suits like you said like foreign clothing and and began right. you know being more skeptical less religious my parents still went through the rituals with me they they took me for christmas christmas and what's called theophany and, and easter and they baptized me but i was raised really predominantly secular human uh yeah, like, which yeah. is that you know that that uh that that postmodern or modern christianity that you talked about but it was my longing for those roots that you said that sometimes it, it skips a generation like uh, you know like yeah, you were facilitating yeah. and, that you're, and you're and you're and your and your parents are probably still like okay this is a little weird but i i can see why he gets into this right you know and and um and uh, you know, presumably, um, you know, I don't know if your children will grow up speaking Gaz, but uh, oh, definitely uh, first language. Uh, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> Does anyone speak Gaz? No one speaks Gaz. It's the first language, I, I imagine. <laughs> um, um, but I'm sure there are kids. Like I'm sure there are, there are like you know church schools that you can go to where like Absolutely. your three and four year olds will speak Gaz. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, yeah. up, my own bishop, who I talked about as an example, because this changes in the fifties. Uh, before the fifties, we don't have a Amharic Bible. You know. Um, uh, from the orthodox really? church yeah yeah like oh, everything oh yeah, it's all, yeah everything is good they, everything they is good. Even, yeah yeah so yeah, right. my own bishop he was one of the first people ever when he was a young monk to begin reading amharic in the church and these are all people of the amharic speaking tribe and he right. said the the elder clerics at the time looked down at him with derision and would say this man began reading newspapers in our holy church and the reason they said that <laughs> is because the only amharic they knew about in written form were the newspapers right. so it's like well, what's this guy reading you know? and that's their tribe you know so yeah, it, you yeah, know, it yeah. shows like how how that has changed but yeah it, you can still find pockets like i met a guy a couple years ago in minnesota who he was from a church where one sermon a year was in amharic but every like song church service reading pure goods there are still pockets right. of that in in rural right. ethiopia right and not right. in the capital right. city but in rural ethiopia right. so all i'd have to do is you know take them to rural for a little bit and, and there are even <laughs> places within the capital city you can go to to put them in those environments you know you could even turn yeah. your house into that type of environment sure learning. sure 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 but if, you know of course you know when you restore and recreate that tradition it's not quite the same the postmodern no. thing is not quite the same as the pre-modern thing but no. that doesn't mean it has to suck um and yeah and i mean I, I i sense that um like the attraction of you know the sort of postmodern restoration of like you know i mean you know young people who are catholic certainly seem like uh, you know, much more interested in the Latin mass than, mm -hmm. in a, you know, <laughs> um, in an English speaking mass, which just, again, is a total and the outsider. Longer version. 
and the longer and the, version and, of the and the Latin longer mass. and the longer version of the Latin Mass. And you know, yeah. it's just like like as a as a, as a complete outsider, I'm just like the idea of these half Protestant, you know. Uh, English masses or are they even masses or like I'm just like <laughs> why how can you not prefer the real thing to this like you know imitation so I no. think we'll see uh, I think we'll see uh, you know I think that the the 21st century will be a good century for archaeofuturism and uh, I, I hope so too thank you so much yeah. Curtis for all right doing all right this. Thank, I, thank you so much for having me yeah. on I, I reached out because I I could sense that that you care you know whatever yeah. else you know metaphysical ethical prescriptions I just I think I have a good emotional intelligence, you know, and I, I sensed from, you know, what I could say. Yeah. That well, I would, I would that. love to get to, Eth I would love to get to Ethiopia sometime, maybe, uh, you know, sometime in the future when the virus is dead, uh, you know, we can fly there together. But, Let's uh, do it. Let's do it. All right. All right. All right.